We are going to do some color grading. This is going to be long form. So sit back, relax. This isn't a quick overview of color grading. We're going to dive deep into how I like to color my footage in Premiere, Adobe Premiere. If you're looking for Final Cut, that's not here. If you're looking for Resolve, look elsewhere. There's plenty of people who talk about how they color in each of these programs, but I thought I would take some time to talk about how I like to do it. Now, this is just my personal opinion that I am by no means a color expert. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there more talented than me, but we can at least talk about some of the tools that I'm using to maybe shed some light on your own process, see if there's anything that I'm doing right or I'm doing wrong, and then you can kind of learn and figure out what works for your workflow because everyone does it a little bit different, and I think it's good to understand all the tools and workflow opportunities that are out there just so you can kind of paint a picture of what's gonna work best for you. So again, sit back, relax. This is not gonna be quick. This is gonna be long, but I'm gonna make it hopefully fun and enjoyable and you'll learn something along the way. I wanted to do this because today, Gerald Undone posted an excellent video talking about common log grading mistakes and how to avoid them. He does a lot in Resolve, talks about grading log and what you're looking for, um, kind of with color charts and, and you can kind of look at and, and reading the graphs to really understand how to grade log and what LUTs are doing because it isn't an easy just apply contrast and saturation and you're done. It is not that. but. His video is very technical. I'm gonna try and avoid some of the, the really technical stuff. I'm gonna try not talk about IRE and 18% gray and that kind of stuff. This will be more of kind of a creative session as well as some of the practical tools that can be used along the way. But I do really recommend Gerald's video. It's excellent. Go check it out if you wanna kind of understand why log isn't the same as some of your regular picture profiles, you know, like linear color and the different color modes on cameras. Really, really good stuff. I should also say that I'm going to be using uh, Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro footage. So if you look up, because I wasn't quite sure if the film mode on the Ursa Mini Pro is actually a log mode, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but at least for preference, uh, preference you can kind of know what, what I'm using versus what you're using, because it might be different depending on the type of footage you're playing with, whether it's Sony or Canon or Panasonic. They're all a little bit different. They all have their own different log modes, they even have, you know, log one, two, three, various flavors. I'm using Blackmagic, the film mode on the Ursa Mini Pro, which is right here. And I also want to mention, I'm going to be talking about some LUTs. They're from Emotive Color. They have a variety of LUTs for a bunch of different cameras, the GH5, GH5S, uh, the Ursa G2, etc. The whole purpose of these LUTs is to match Alexa footage. So we're going to talk about that more in detail later, but just as a frame of reference, uh, you don't necessarily have to get these LUTs, um, nor do I think you should. I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying for frame of reference, this is where I got them. You can also check out the LUTs from Leaming LUT Pro. Again, a bunch of, of LUTs, and these are meant more for like matching cameras to kind of standardize everything because that's a, an issue a lot of people have on projects where they're using footage from different cameras. That's what these LUTs are for. I'm not gonna really play with these very much, but I do want to recommend them as another resource out there as LUTs that are available that are highly recommended. And we are gonna talk through some documentation. Um, this isn't super interesting, um, but I did want to at least have it on standby just as a frame of reference if we need to dive into it and talk about some of this workflow stuff. But again, this is what's boring. I don't really want to get into much of that. I want to spend more time on the creative practical tools. So with that being said, we can hop into Premiere and I can show you kind of what I've built, this little sequence of clips from some projects I've worked on recently. And of course, Premiere is gonna pinwheel on me right as I'm streaming. But uh, anyway, we're in Premiere and uh, I've got this set up already, but I'm gonna kind of break it down so we can talk through what's happening. And this is this is the, the baseline. This is gonna be first the kind of technical way to do it with LUTs specifically with the Ursa footage, but then we're gonna get into some of the more fun ways to do it with outlets, because I find that satisfying as well. So to start with, uh, here's a clip. I like using clips with people in them for skin tone and that kind of reference. I think it's really important when you're doing any kind of color grading to not just look at like a chart or a wall or some grass, you know, like look at skin tone, look at people, 
because that's what is like the most familiar. It is like the, the standard of what is supposed to look good whenever you talk about cameras and color grading, people always wanna talk about skin tones. So I wanted to make sure I pulled some of those clips in here with skin tones so we can look at them. Anyway, I've got these clips in here. They're just on a timeline. Again, this is gonna be the kind of the LUT workflow. Now you can see uh, with the Lumetri scopes over here, and again, this is just Premiere, DaVinci Resolve has much more advanced coloring tools, but I know there's a lot of people who do edit and color all in Premiere. In fact, that's how I tend to do it, just for simplicity and ease of use. Every once in a while, I may involve Resolve in my workflow, but usually if I can get the job done in Premiere, I like to stay all in one ecosystem. That way I'm not bouncing around between different applications and complicating the workflow. And then it's a little bit easier to involve other people in it as well. So we have this clip. This is all 4K Ursa Mini Pro footage, uh, shot ProRes. This isn't a raw workflow. That's something else I wanted to avoid because raw is a whole another beast in terms of file size and, and storage and even just potential of what you can do with the footage because it's raw. There's so much more flexibility there. A lot of people don't have a raw workflow yet. So this is operating off of ProRes, a little bit better than some of the hybrid you know cameras out there, but really some of the same principles should apply. Just because I'm using ProRes footage from the Ursa Mini doesn't mean some of this stuff wouldn't apply to, let's say a GH5, for example, or a Canon, uh, whatever you have, or a Sony, uh, for that matter. It is gonna be limited, you know, if it's 8-bit or 10-bit and all that stuff. But again, that's technical stuff. I don't wanna get into that. So let's get into it. The recommended process for the, <laughs> the uh, Emotive LUTs to match kind of the Alexa because that's kind of the, the gold standard of, of beautiful imagery is the Alexa footage. I'm, I'm gonna walk you through that real quick and you can kind of see why this may be a little cumbersome for some people and why you may not want to implement, but you at least know how to do it. The first step is to come into your effects and with your Lumetri, they have like a pre-effect, which is basically to set your baseline exposure. When I'm shooting at the Ursa, almost always I'm about a stop over. It's just more comfortable to monitor on set that way. Um, it's a little bit easier to shoot run and gun if you don't have um, you know, color cards, which I do have, and I should mention, because it was in the, uh, the thumbnail. You know, these color cards can be very, very valuable if you're trying to match specific colors, get everything perfect, perfectly colored. Um, and set exposure, of course. These though, you don't always have on hand and they're not, they're not always convenient just to insert into a frame or get before a shot. Sometimes it's a little more run and gun, a little bit more documentary style. You may not have time. You don't have to get these ones. This is the Spider Checker 24, but there's many. There's like the Passport one that opens up that's a little bit smaller. There's some bigger ones. So there are a variety of those and I do recommend you at least have one so you get familiar and comfortable with using it. But I also understand many times, even on shoots that I'm on, like I'm not pulling out the color checker for every single shot. It's just not always practical and functional. There's a lot of stuff on the internet of like best practices of how you're supposed to do things. And then a real shoot comes up and you realize, oh, all that best practice stuff I'm supposed to be doing isn't really functional on a, on a shoot right now. So knowing it is good, but you don't always put it into practice, just something to remember, just because someone says there's a best way to do something doesn't mean you have to always do it that way. Sometimes there's some workarounds that are more efficient when you're maybe the sun is setting and you just have to get the shot. Are you going to spend time to pull out all your bells and whistles, your light meters and your color checkers while the sun's setting and you're going to miss the shot you want to get? Probably not. So keep that in mind. Back into Premiere. So I'm typically shooting the Ursa Mini footage one stop over, and I found that, you know, based on this LUT, that's the other thing to remember. With LUTs, they always are expecting a certain input value to get the uh, desired output value. So if you don't shoot them based on the documentation, which I can pull up here, right, you have to read through all this and know, like, how to shoot it, and because it's expecting certain input values of exposure and whatnot. So if you don't shoot it that way, you're gonna run into a little bit of problems if you just put the LUT right on it. So for example, if I just throw a LUT onto this footage, which I can pull in here, and I gotta, of course, I'm streaming, so Premiere is, decides to uh, be really, really slow uh, while I'm doing this for whatever reason. If this doesn't work out, it may uh, end up not working. But uh, it looks like it's working now. I need to pull this up, and of course, it's not gonna work for me. In any case, if you were just to, I'm glad I actually did all this work beforehand uh, so that I'm not having these issues. 
if you do put a LUT straight on the footage, if it's not shot properly the way the LUT is expecting it, it's not gonna look that, that great. So what you need to do instead is you need to put uh, basically a pre-LUT on there. It's gonna set the exposure, whether it needs to go up or whether it's gonna go down. All this stuff comes standard with most LUT packages if it's a well-made LUT. A lot of LUTs are just kind of the color grading stuff where you put it on there to get a certain look. That's not what this stuff is for. This is meant for actually like transforming your footage from like LUT, from log space to linear space. So it's very, very precise the order you need to do things in. So basically put uh, a pre-LUT on there to get your kind of baseline exposure, which I have on here. So there's like a pre-LUT and then you put that on the basic color correction here, the input LUT, and then you do a second Lumetri effect. This is how they recommend to do it. You do a second Lumetri effect, which is where you actually do your color LUT, um, which would just match kind of whatever, you know, uh, white balance you're, you're using. And then you also need to do under the creative tab. So the basic tab, you do the color light, the LUT, and then under creative, you set your black level as kind of like your post LUT. So there's three LUTs involved in this process. There's a pre LUT, a color LUT, and then a post LUT. That can be a lot and it has to be in a specific order. I have it set up with an adjustment layer. So when I toggle this on, it works. But to do that per clip or an adjustment layer that affects everything evenly can be a very cumbersome workflow, as well as they recommend for to match the Alexa footage to kind of set an optical low pass filter because the Alexa has one internally on the camera. So to kind of match that, what you can do is you can set another adjustment layer. If you turn that on, you basically set the opacity to 20% and you can use a Gaussian blur around like 10, 15 or 20, depending on how much of that kind of smoothing you wanna do. Essentially the optical low pass filter is gonna blur the image slightly without losing detail. It's not a straight blur. So that's why you're, you're using as an adjustment layer and you're turning the opacity down to 20%, just so it's kind of like, it's almost like a little glow, a softening of the image, if you will. And typically just as one of the things I personally like to do with my color on the Ursa, I will go in and I will add some sharpening to my footage just to give it a little bit more pop. So under uh, the creative uh, section, you can add some sharpness. Of course, you can do this over on the right Lumetri panel as well, where it's a little bit more visual. It just depends on where you wanna be looking. Do you wanna look over here on the right uh, in, in your kind of color layout, or do you wanna be kind of in your more traditional effects and filters tab? You can do it either way, it doesn't really matter. I tend to be more on the right-hand side because it's very visual and easy to kind of see the sliders and what's happening. Um, and you can kind of set your sharpness and whatnot uh, more easily. But that's what we're looking at. So with the kind of baseline LUTs applied, I'm pretty happy with how this looks. Uh, if anything, it, I did bump the initial exposure down a little bit more past one, one stop. It wasn't two stops over, but it was a little bit more than one. So as it was shot, it was just a tad too much on the bright side for kind of baseline. So I brought that initial exposure down. From here is where you would do all of your uh, color grading, your co if you want this warmer or cooler, if you want it more saturated or less saturated, or you want to tweak your, your skin tones or anything like that, because now you've taken it from log space into more of like Rec. 709 where you have, you know, kind of your full contrast and saturation that you're playing with, and you can go from there. Really watch Gerald's video because it's important that you understand why you need to do it with LUTs um, that way to get this baseline, because a, a log profile isn't a, an even like kind of one-to-one -one where it's the same throughout. It, it curves off um, with the log curve. So watch that video because it's, it's very valuable. But anyway, here's where you would add color to kind of make it a little bit more pretty or, or, or stylized, however you would like. Now, one thing I like to do um, is not actually do it this way. I'm just showing it this way because this is kind of the, the one methodology for doing it very precise. Now, this is again requiring a very specific input to get the desired output. So if it's not shot properly or you know, you're know you on a shoot and the footage doesn't really match, it can be more of a challenge because if you don't have good input, you're gonna struggle to get good output. So with the LUT workflow, specifically this style LUT workflow, you really need to make sure everything is going, going really well. And I've pulled some footage here from some different shoots. Um, so, Different shoot, different day, totally different thing. Same LUTs are applied as because they're just adjustment layers over top of everything. And you can see that, I'll make this a little bit bigger. 
you can see what we're looking at and how it's, um, let me pop back to the other sequence, how it's sort of matching, you know, because typically when I'm doing shoots, I'm shooting sort of the same way on each and every one. So as long as I do a good job with that process, the coloring methodology should be the same as well. And we can click through here, see a few more examples of, of different uh, situations where you can see there's like some color differences here. This is all stuff you would want to fine tune and dial in probably after doing uh, the LUTs just kind of set a baseline for everything. You, and again, you don't have to do it with these adjustment layers. You could do it on the clip itself. And I should mention that if you don't know this, you can color uh, with effects on the clip right here, but then you can also put it on the master clip which would be wherever that clip is referenced, it has the exact same color. Oftentimes I am coloring on the master. However, because color is a very tedious process of order of operations, if you color on the master and then you can color later on the clip and then those can end up competing with one another and you might you know, uh, add too much contrast and you lose information in the blacks or in the whites and then your color later can end up messing all that up. So you just have to be careful if you're doing it that way, but I do find often if it's, it's a, a continuous shot that all matches color wise, you can do it all in the master. That way you're not chasing down multiple effects on the same clip. If that doesn't make sense, maybe I'll do another video about that, but it is something to know that's sort of not always obvious in Premiere that you can color on the master clip. You can do a lot of stuff on the master clip. So anytime it's referenced, you have the same information displayed. It can be very valuable in certain situations. We're not doing that here. I'm just using adjustment layers for simplicity. And we'll keep going through this kind of this footage here. And here's a shot that the white balance is, is off. It's a little cool. Um, I might want to warm it up a little bit, but you can see how it was shot. Just the film mode on the Ursa Mini Pro. Got beautiful dynamic range as you do with the Ursa Mini. But when we put the LUTs on, you can see that it's a little bit cool uh, compared to what I would want for this shot. So what you can do, and you can do this in a variety of different places, and this is where it gets a little tricky because you have multiple Lumetri effects. And if you want to warm it up, are you doing it before all the LUTs? Are you doing it after? I'm going to do it before, just on the clip. Uh, so we can see what it does. But if you wanted to warm this up, let's say like 15, maybe 30, and I'm staring at a light now, so I'm gonna do my best to, to at least match the screen. Coloring on a laptop, this is not ideal circumstances for doing color grading, but uh, I'll try and do my best. And then it's like, it looks a tad magenta to me. So you can use the temperature and tint sliders to kind of dial in the white balance if it is off for whatever reason, because that that's important to get right. Your white balance, it should look good. Um, and maybe that's a little too warm. Uh, well, maybe something in between there, I don't know. It depends on kind of the mood you want for the shot, right? Color is very subjective. What do you, what feelings and emotions are you trying to evoke with the visuals in your sequence? But I definitely like the look of that better than as shot, because as shot, just too cold. Let's warm it up a little bit, even it out, make it look a little nice. Uh, another shot from uh, same kind of sequence, so we can warm that one up. Same way we did the other one, kind of even it out a little bit and get a feel for setting that baseline. And we'll move right along. Another clip from the uh, same shoot. And this one looks like it was probably, um, you know, that that pre effect of dropping it down by a, a stop might be a little bit too severe. Um, so we theoretically could play with exposure here and brighten it up a little bit if we wanted to on the clip. Um, but again, you gotta be very careful where you're doing these things because you have this stacking series of filters that you know you have your Lumetri Pre, your color, and then your final output black levels. So there's a lot of effects going on. And then you have the clip effects, you have master clip effects. When you're doing this type of stuff, it's very easy to lose track of what's where, and then you can be competing where you warm something up and then you change, decide to change it later and you cool it back off with a different filter or effect. And now you have all these things overlapping and it's just kind of messy to do it that way, but you can do it. Uh, so on this clip, maybe we'll warm this up. Similarly, warm it up, maybe too much magenta, balance it out a little bit. That's looking, looking pretty nice. Maybe just a little, little dark, but we could always fix that later with some fine tuning. Same kind of thing, very, very uh, cool on the white balance, warm it up, and hopefully you kind of get a sense that you can kind of see how things are working and playing uh, as we're going through this. Where we have those LUTs in place, 
to add the contrast. If I turn these off, you're gonna see that typical low contrast, low saturation log look, and it's Ursa Mini, their film profile. But when we turn that on, get a better sense of kind of what we're working with. And, you know, theoretically, you could really warm it up if that's the, the look you were going for. I think for most of these situations, I like to set just like a nice even baseline, something that looks decent. That might even be, yeah, something like that. Looks very nice. And again, we have another shot here. You can see how it was shot, just baseline. Now, there's a lot of greenery in here, so we're getting some green cast and bounce. But in general, again, we're taking log, we're transforming it to linear, so we have nice contrast and saturation, and then we can play around with it from there. So if we said, oh, this is a little too green, you know, maybe we like two, two on the magenta, and then maybe we want to warm it up just a little bit or something, and we could do something like that. I don't know. It, it gets down to where it's very subjective and in your personal preference, and you can spend hours on one shot just getting it uh, to perfection. I'm going to go over some of that a little bit more in detail after we're clear away from these LUTs, but I at least wanted to show you what this can do very, very quickly if you're intentionally shooting everything uh, knowing your LUT workflow after the fact. Because if you get it right in camera and on set, the LUTs actually work really, really well and they're very fast. It's when it's not shot properly that the LUTs can be more of a, a hassle and a challenge. Here's another shot. You can see how it was shot initially. So exposure good, white balance is good. We put the LUT on there, we put the optical low pass filter on there and we look at them and we say, hey, that looks great. Maybe a little bit more saturation, maybe brighten it up, maybe add a vignette, whatever we want to do to stylize it, but you get the point, hopefully at, at, at this phase. I'm gonna pop over and show how I kind of do it without LUTs. And I don't know that I would recommend this for every single camera and every single workflow, but hopefully there's some lessons that can be learned here, specifically as they, re the, as they relate to the Ursa Mini Pro, as well as some of the other Blackmagic cameras, and maybe some things you can incorporate into your own workflow. So we're not gonna use LUTs now. We're gonna go same series of shots, and I'm gonna show you kind of how I like to do it, Again, I'm not an expert by any means of like, you have to do it this way, or this is you know pixel perfect, accurate. We could be looking at scopes over here, but in general, a lot of people, they're using footage from a variety of different cameras, variety of different shooters, variety of different types of events. And so you kind of have to get comfortable working with anything, and it's probably not always gonna be perfect. If you can make it perfect, by all means, yes, do it the right way. But hopefully some of these tips will help kind of streamline that stuff. Before we get into that, I'm gonna bounce over to the chat just to see if anything's going on over there. No, we're good, perfect. Bouncing back into Premiere. Um, so here's where I wanna start. With the Ursa Mini Pro, what I like to do, bring my shadows all the way down and my highlights all the way up. The reason I do that is because you can think of the, shot, uh, the shadows and highlights in Premiere, in Lum Lumetri, is kind of like an S-curve, more or less. You're not changing your extreme you know, uh, whites and blacks. Those would be these sliders, so you can see it clearly overexposes, and then your blacks get really crunchy. But in general, your shadows and your highlights can go all the way down, all the way up with the Ursa footage. And typically, that starts to add a nice contrast as like a baseline. Will I always go up to 100 on the highlights? No, not necessarily. Sometimes I'll just go up to 50. Uh, will I always go down to negative 100 on the shadows? No, not always. Sometimes I'll go down to negative 75. But in general, it's about adding contrast as a, as a first line uh, operation with the highlights and shadows uh, for under basic correction. Then from there, I would play with my whites, maybe bringing them up just a little bit. Typically, it's maybe like 15, and then my blacks down a little bit you know, just to add some more contrast, but not lose detail. And maybe we'll pull that down to like negative 50. The reason I like doing this as opposed to curves or, or a LUT or any other method is because I have direct control over the numerical values for replication. And I know the difference between a negative 75 and like negative 77, let's say. If you're working in curves, often like these points are very hard to line up if for replication from shot to shot to shot. And if you wanna tweak something ever so slightly, one small move, even if you expand the curves and make them gigantic, this is specifically in Premiere, Resolve does a little bit better, but in Premiere, the curves can be very difficult to work with 
because they're not as precise as I would like them to be. So that's why I started doing this workflow for myself, just for my own sanity, so I could use even numbers, you know, and say, oh, that's at 50, I actually want it at 60. And you know kind of exactly what that movement is gonna be mathematically, rather than just like on a graph, moving a point to some other arbitrary point, and you're like, I think that's in the right spot, but I don't really know. And if you're trying to match shot the shot, you'd say, well, on the other one it was 50, and on this one I'll make it 50, if it's the mathematical, you know, numbers. But with the curves, you have more fine tuning precision because it's the curve. You can go wherever you want and you can make the curve look what, like whatever you want. But it can also be very hard to get it exactly where you want it because it's a, a visual dot rather than a number. And with the Ursa Mini Pro footage, the highlights and shadows work really well. This may not apply to every single log camera, but definitely give it a try to see if it, if it works for you. So I would start here. And like I said before, color is never done. You could spend hours doing this, but that's at least a good baseline. And then I move into creative. And like I said before, I typically add some sharpening just to kind of make it pop. If we zoom in here to 100%, let's see if it's gonna let me, cause it's really, <laughs> really chugging. Uh, apparently it doesn't want me to do that. So we're not gonna zoom in, but we can see, trust me, if you zoom in, there's a little bit more detail there when you sharpen it up just ever so slightly. And typically with the 4K Ursa Mini Pro footage, 50 seems to be like a good number, but of course it could be higher or lower depending on the lens you're using and the kind of look you want it to have, but it just helps add a little crisp detail that I kind of like. Then I would come into curves. And this is typically where, again, if I'm shooting on the Ursa Mini Pro, if I'm shooting kind of one stop over typically, according to like what the camera kind of wants you to do, um, you can, I, I typically always like to pull this down a little bit just to set my skin tones kind of where, where I think they're, they're kind of like n nice looking um, and always pulling your noise down. Very rarely do you want to shoot something underexposed and then lift it up because then you're lifting all the noise up with it. So I just come in for the curve and I do it on the curve as opposed to up here under exposure because exposure moves the whole image range and you can get some very gray highlights you can get some really ugly uh, like shadows in there. So I usually only use exposure when I'm dealing with like LUTs or I'm setting as if my exposure were, you know, something to begin with, one stop under, one stop over. If I'm doing more creative grading and I'm going for a look, I'll use curves to pull the exposure down um, without moving, you know, my white point or my black point. So I'm still keeping the full contrast of the image. I'm just kind of adjusting and bending the curve. Do I want it brighter and more airy or do I want it kind of darker and more cinematic? And a lot of times I go for kind of darker and more cinematic. It just tends to be the vibe I like, but it really depends on the project you're working on. So maybe that's a little too dark. Again, I'm looking at a screen with a big bright light behind it. So apologies if it's not quite perfect. Uh, so we'll do that. And then this is where I'll also do some of like the white balance optimization. So if the, the shot is like a little bit too green or it's too red or too blue, um, I'll come into my curves as well. And typically a lot of times, you know, there's just like a tad more green than I'd like. So maybe pull some of that out. And then for this shot with all these kind of uh, barrels here, I kind of want to warm it up to really sell that, that kind of warmth of everything. So I'll pull some blue out and I'll add some red in minor minor adjustments and you know it's very easy to go overboard with these curves because they're just they're so finicky and this is why i only like doing it for for this step because it's just one point anytime you're messing with curves if i make a point up here right now you're affecting two parts <laughs> of the image the highlights and the shadows so you know one point in the middle up or down do i want to add red take it out do i want to add blue take it out or green you know add it or take it away so that's what I'm doing there. Maybe it's not quite perfect, but I'll uh, keep moving right along. Now I'm gonna look at my hue versus saturation. These curves are really, really powerful. If you've never played around with these, you need to. Um, Premiere didn't have these for the longest time. It was always like a feature for Resolve. And then finally they implemented it in, uh, I think 2019 Premiere into Lumetri. So uh, what I like to do is typically in a shot like this, if there's a color that is absent, I'll almost always desaturate it just to get rid of any kind of weird rogue discoloration, color noise, anything like that. So this, there's like no blue in this shot at all. So I know that I can kind of pull the blue out, which basically putting one, a point in the middle and pulling it down. I'm gonna do that. And uh, just to clean up any of those like rogue color elements, pull it down. 
And you may not want to go all the way down because that's really going to desaturate it, but just something, you know, down about there just to reduce that. If you had an ocean and you wanted it to be really blue, you would do the inverse and make it, you know, very, very saturated. Essentially, this curve is your hue and then up or down is your saturation. And then I'll typically, almost always, um, play around with my hue versus hue, specifically for skin tones. A lot of times people have um, more discoloration in their skin tone than is you know, appealing if they're not wearing makeup. That's what makeup's for, kind of evens all that stuff out and makes it kind of nice. But uh, a lot of people, if you're running gun and they're not wearing makeup, they might have just kind of their natural blemishes and wrinkles and all sorts of stuff on, in their skin. And just so just to even that out, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take my reds and I'll move them more towards orange and I'll take my yellows and move those more towards orange. So basically on this side of the curve, you can pull the reds down just a little bit and not a lot. Like this is very, very, very sensitive. And then your yellows, they can pull up towards orange just a little bit to kind of even things out. Again, you could be far more precise with this and a little bit better probably um, dialing it in here. This is why I think curves are really irritating. I'd much rather have like hard numerical values and just to dial it in very, very specifically, but it is what it is and you gotta use the tools at, at hand. So I kind of do just like a little evening out of that. Maybe even pull this kind of red magenta a little bit more towards the orange, but not much not much at all. And depending on the skin tone, depending on the scene, you can get away with this more, you might have to do less of it, but it's just to kind of make all of the skin tones more of a uniform color rather than having really red spots or more yellow spots. It's just kind of all orangey, fleshy skin tone, which is kind of nice. And then Hue versus Luma. This is a nice function if you want to draw attention to the skin tone, which typically tends to be a nice little move you can do. Uh, so just in the orange, you can make the oranges just a little bit brighter, which you can really see how much like that affects if I go extreme with it, right? But if I just do a little bit of a pop, it's basically kind of just like brightening up the, the skin tone so the, the viewer's attention is more in that area, which can be nice and a helpful little thing to guide where you want people to look in the scene. In a scene like this, where there's a lot of orange and, and earth tone type colors, it's not as drastic of an effect, but if you're doing, you know, kind of your typical Hollywood teal and um, orange uh, color theory, uh, you can do a far more of it and it can be more uh, more effective. And then uh, likewise, you could always pull, like if you had blue in there and you didn't, you want it to be a little darker, you could pull that down. So uh, the same applies to up here for hue versus hue. You can always make blue more of a certain type of blue or, you know, take your greens and make them more green or less green, more, more yellow. It depends on the, the effect you're going for. But with these curves, Premiere has become a lot more powerful in terms of color uh, grading capability. Now, under Luma versus Saturation, the left side is kind of your, your dark Luma, the dark parts of the image, and then the right side is your brighter areas. And then up and down is the saturation. Well, typically what can end up looking rather nice is the brighter areas being kind of less saturated. So if you have like a wall that's very bright, but it's slightly like off shade of yellow or beige, uh, and you just kind of want it like a white, a white wall, you can uh, pull that down. So you can see really drastic if I do this, like it looks ridiculous, but all the bright parts of the image have lost their saturation and all the dark parts have a lot more saturation. At an extreme, it's quite ugly and cartoony, but in moderation, it can be a very effective way, again, just to kind of shape your image and give it more of that like cinematic where the highlights are just like a clean, white, bright neutral, rather than, you know, sometimes highlights get kind of muddy and yellow or blue, depending on the types of lights you're using and, and what the scene is if you have any kind of color cast. And then, Finally, we have saturation versus saturation, which this is, as it says, you have saturation, so left side uh, is kind of your uh, low saturation, and then the right side is your high saturation, and you can pull that down so that if you know parts of your image that are super, super saturated um, aren't, are, are getting to the point where they're like crazy cartoon colors, you can, on the right side, pull those down, so that would be taking stuff that's really saturated and pulling it down, and then stuff that's less saturated, you're like, ooh, I wanna even this out, so you can pull that stuff up. And again, that's kind of these similar curves right here between the luminous versus saturation and saturation versus saturation can be the right nice little little 
flow that you would want for your image depending on how you're capturing it. And then I'll usually come down here into vignette and I'll add, you know, a slight vignette like 0.5 or something. Maybe that's a little aggressive, maybe 0.3 for this shot. It depends on what you're filming, if it's a wide, if it's a close up. Let's do negative 0.3 just to add some, some vignette there to the corners and draw again our viewer's attention towards the middle. So here's what we did on just that quick, quick pass. If I go to my effects and I just toggle the Lumetri off and on, you can kind of see what we're working with. And then comparatively, if we go back over to the LUT version of this shot, which my keyboard shortcuts aren't working, you can see that image, which to me, I actually almost kind of prefer this one, again, with a little bit more fine tuning and dialing in, because I get very precise and particular about exactly those curves and where those dots are lining up. But in general, I kind of like this look compared to just the standard LUT. Either, either way, you could get to the desired effect, but you may be doing a lot more work with the LUT in this particular situation to get to this point. And the reason for that, um, Gerald talks about in his video about using curves to kind of mitigate the way that, that log stores information. And that can be valuable for certain situations where you want the maximum dynamic range and you don't want anything to look too weird um, to make sure that it's exactly accurate. But a lot of times with color, it's more about like the style and the feeling. And so if you are using a LUT workflow and you're not getting the desired effect, I would say try something different and try both to see which one works for you in different situations. Sometimes some shots may benefit from just a, a strict kind of LUT process. And other times it might be more beneficial to your shot in the final in the final product going through something more custom and dialed in, even though it's not quite technically as accurate or the right way to do it. I still find these tools in Premiere to be very, very valuable. And then of course we can always check our scopes and see, you know, if you know we need to brighten it up overall, if it's too dark. Um, we can always add saturation um, if we go look at our vector scope. But in general, I might add some more saturation to this just overall uh, to bring that up. And uh, it looks a little green to my eye here and I might tweak some of those colors, maybe even make it a little bit darker. I just tend to kind of like, like that look uh, of it kind of being a little bit moodier. And then let's go back into our curves and I'm gonna play with these a little bit more aggressively, the Lumiverse saturation. And cause you can see like it gets really, really crazy there. But I'll clean up some of the highlights a little bit and pull those down just a little bit more. Neutralize it ever so slightly in those highlights. Because typically that is, it's like the specular type stuff, which you can just want nice and clean. So anyway, that's one shot. And you could do this for all of these shots. In fact, if we apply this same, the same kind of way we did the LUTs, we could use this specific look that we've dialed in here for this other footage and apply it there. And we see, okay, maybe this is a little dark, but in general, I kind of like where the color landed on that. So we know that that was just on this curve that we brought the exposure down. So maybe we do something like that. And, you know, we're in a, a really good kind of baseline spot. Again, same way that you'd be working with LUTs, but we have kind of more of this like custom color at the same time we're correcting for log. This is why I really like the Blackmagic footage. I'll admit it's not quite as easy to do this with V-Log on the GH5. For whatever reason, the Blackmagic film mode works really well for LUTs because I mean, any LUT should be designed for the profile that it's working with. But I don't know if it's because Blackmagic makes DaVinci Resolve and they're just kind of making a really nice col like color gradable profile, but it works really, really well. Um, why? I, I can't tell you that, but for, for my purposes um, and doing it this way, it ends up working out quite nicely. And it's not letting me copy and paste <laughs> that, that uh, look for whatever reason. Uh, I'm trying to copy this over to another clip. Always seems to be issues when I'm, uh, hey, that copy and pasted just fine. So why didn't this one work when I'm streaming? There we go. A um, little bit warm maybe for my taste. A little on the warm side. So we can go pull some of the red out. So those minor, minor adjustments in the curves, 
which can be the most tedious thing. Uh, yeah, something like that looks pretty nice. And again, color, very subjective. It might look nice to me and you might think that looks like garbage, but hopefully there's some stuff in here that you find value in. Um, same thing here with this shot. So uh, probably could afford to darken this one just a little bit and I would warm this one up ever so slightly. But the nice thing is we have control over all this stuff and we know if you know how it all works you can really get it to do kind of whatever you want um, the main thing that I like using is the highlights and shadows to start with the Ursa mini footage it just seems to be a really nice way to add that the curve to the image without having to use actual curves because the, the moment you have a couple points on there it can be a really huge pain to make sure each one's perfectly lined up you start adding a few and then they're all affecting each other can be very, very annoying. Um, definitely the more precise way to do it, and you do get some benefits from using a, a curve, but just as like a baseline, if you're looking for a quick grade to get something out the door, uh, I definitely like this methodology. Um, and then you can always refine it and go from there. Same thing here. I don't, uh, on this method, uh, with the LUTs I talked about, these temperature and tint sliders, I don't like using them for general color because if you pull this way over here, it, it kind of pulls the whole image warm rather than saving you know, the, the bright white clouds. They're not white anymore. It's kind of tinted everything. And same if you pull it blue, it pulls the whole image where the curves still retain their white points at the end. So you can make it a lot you know, more yellow but you still have kind of white whites, which can be, I think, a little bit nicer look for a lot of this stuff. If you just tint your whole thing warm, it kind of looks sepia tone, you know, or cool. It looks just like you tinted it as a filter, and I don't think that's really all that uh, pleasing to the eye. I definitely prefer to use curves, because again, you keep your white points where they're supposed to be. If you didn't want the clouds to be white, you could pull your white point down and make your clouds yellow, if you wanted for whatever reason, if that was the look you were going for, but um, not something I typically do. I'm usually playing with just my midpoint to kind of tweak and color as needed. Now in this one, here's a good example. We have a sky, a nice blue sky. So if we want it to be really blue, we could pop that saturation and theoretically you could pull your saturation down on the warm tones if you wanted to do that kind of effect. That's where you can play around with it and just have fun. So here, when we did the LUT initially, it had that kind of, it was too cool. It had some magenta in there. I think this looks really nice just with our baseline corrections that we did. You know, the, the highlights, the shadows. So a little bit of contrast there in the whites and blacks. We're not tweaking the exposure one way or the other. Again, we can look just as this was shot baseline. And then it's like, okay, we added some contrast. We added some, some color, some saturation there. But it's looking, I think, in, in a better spot, to, to my eye at least, than what the, the LUT was doing. Because again, the LUT is, is expecting a certain very precise input rather than something that comes in and you're coloring it based on, on how you perceive it. I don't know if that's a good way to, to describe it, but the LUT is looking for specific inputs to generate outputs rather than something like this that can be a little bit more creative and, and flexible and practical. Maybe. Maybe you really like LUTs. That's fine too. So there we go. That's just the settings we had copied and pasted. Again, we could you know bump our highlights up more, but typically that's probably too much contrast for my taste. You know, keep uh, keep those highlights nice and smooth and not too not too much video you know video contrast. We want film film contrast. Uh, and typically the way this was shot, it's, you know, pulling the shadows down, getting rid of the noise, but not lifting too much of the other stuff up. So we've got that. We could play around with the color here a little bit, the curves here. Maybe it's, uh, maybe for some reason we want this one to be brighter, more airy. Then we could go in and, and pull some, uh, some more contrast into the shadow areas if we wanted and do something like that. Just really depends on your personal preference, but I kind of like that look. The only thing for this, being a, uh, a farmer here, maybe we warm it up a little bit, give it more of a farmland vibe. 
without it being too red. Maybe something like that. It's going to look different on every screen. That's the other inevitable thing about color is that everyone's watching it on a different device. Might be a different phone, a tablet, TV, computer, where people are watching really affects the colors they see and, and how they're, they see them. You can do the best job in the world on the most accurate, you know, calibrated monitor and someone's still going to be watching it in an airport on some TV with stock settings and it's going to look, you know, t terrible <laughs> by, by your uh, standards. So it's really, uh, it's the struggle of anyone who does color and really wants it to look a certain way is you don't get to decide how everyone gets to view it. Even, you know, you go to, you know, you watch a movie or something and if your TV settings aren't calibrated right, well, it's going to look, it's going to look not, not how as it was intended. So there's that shot. We can move on. We have this shot. which we can apply a copy paste. My uh, computer here is really struggling. That is definitely not what we want that to look like because uh, we warmed that other one up, you know, far too, too much for, for this color. So just take those off and kind of see what we're, we're working with. Uh, maybe it needs a little less green. And the greens themselves are looking a little looking a little sad on those green leaves in the background so we're going to go into the hue and saturation and we could uh we could of course overall you could change your white balance to kind of warm it up or cool it off um, in this case we want to cool it off to get rid of some of that yellowness in the uh the foliage there but again we could change the hue to be more see we're playing with the skin tones we can clear that out and kind of reset it so that was already becoming an issue but if we wanted to focus just on the green, we could come in here and we could make the green more of like a cool green. If this, if this catches up, here we go. We might have to move this yellow point over. <laughs> That's an interesting look right there. Uh, you can really see like how much you can shift the hue. Um, to kind of get certain desired effects. So if you want your greens to be greener, that's certainly something you can do with the hue versus hue. And you could of course saturate them more as well. In terms of overall saturation, this shot might need it to kind of make it feel the way we want it to feel. And then finally, okay, paste. And this was really warm from that uh, farmer shot, but maybe that's the look you want to go for. Maybe you really want it kind of golden and amber and nice, um, which I don't mind in this particular situation. And I would say I'm doing a very broad, just like copy and pasting. I don't normally color that way. This is just for illustrative purposes of like the differences between doing these color steps for the Ursa Mini Pro footage versus the LUTs. The LUTs uh, have their benefit and can look nice, uh, but also you don't have to go out of your way to buy them or, or uh, you know, use that specific one. Uh, they can be valuable if you're struggling and you're having issues with your footage. I know other people complain about, you know, some of the Sony log profiles or Canon log or the Panasonic log. Um, even the Panasonic LUTs, I'm not a huge fan of. I got That's why I want to do more testing with the GH5 and some of these other uh, LUT kind of packs, um, the GH uh, Alex ones these ones from Emotive Color, as well as the Leeming LUT, because I've never been very happy with the Panasonic LUTs that are provided, and it can be really irritating to shoot log and then and then struggle because you can't find a good LUT for it. Thankfully, there are so many Pro has such a nice codec and film profile that just coloring it even without a LUT is relatively easy, I would say, from my perspective, as long as you don't make a few mistakes. Um, the, the, those mistakes being don't hardly ever don't use the contrast slider. Um, contrast is very rudimentary and it's just contrast overall. It takes everything and pulls it apart or, or compresses it together. I don't like using the contrast slider. I would much rather dial in just my highlights or just my shadows pulling those up or down because to me it's more of that like S, S curve is like kind of a, has a smoothness to it that just contrast doesn't have. And again, I don't typically use temperature, tint or exposure when I'm coloring this way just because those are very 
they pull the whole image rather than retaining those white points at the end of the curve, which oftentimes can get you into trouble. If you, you know, if you pull this exposure down, all those lights will just turn to gray. You can even see it in the scopes where you just, you don't have highlights anymore. You've pulled everything down, um, which I like to use the curves more for adjusting exposure. It has other complications associated with it, but they're, they're far less of a problem than uh, the exposure slider can be in this situation. And then uh, saturation, you can go uh, pretty mild with it. You don't have to do too much uh, in this situation. Creative, I very rarely do any of this other vibrance or saturation. It's really if you need it for those certain situations where you want a very, very specific look, um, in which case you could add a lot and stuff here, but really I just use creative for, for sharpening. And then curves is where I do most of the fine tuning color work. So it's almost like I break up, if this is a good way to look at it, I break up my contrast into the basic correction with the highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And then I do all my color correction in the hue, saturation, curves, and then with the RGB curves. I do technically set the kind of exposure with my um, kind of master curve here, but in general, I think that is kind of a, a nice way to think about it, using the uh, basic correction for contrast and then using curves for more of the color saturation, uh, fine tuning uh, elements. And then very rarely do I use the color wheels and match. That's more for like problem solving. If there's a, a specific issue in a shot, a color is wrong, there is a color that's uh, causing some issue on the skin tone or in the background, it's the wrong color. You can tweak all that with your color wheels and match, as well as your uh, HSL secondary, where you can you know mask out certain regions of, of an image, a certain color, and you know change that particular color to another one. I find it to be problematic in the sense of the same way that green screening can be in certain situations, where if you're picking it off of like your chroma and, and you're sampling colors, it can get some problems with like uh, where you see like the edges of pixels and whatnot. I find the curves adjustments to be far smoother and more even because you're not just selecting a certain batch of pixels or a certain color region. You're ramping up and down from that region. So everything follows the curve rather than a set set range. You can play with your secondary adjustments and, and how much they select, but I just find them to be, usually they result in more problems than they're worth unless there is a specific problem in your image that you're trying to fix that you can't do otherwise. But that's more for like advanced stuff and not something I do, um, you know, baseline. Some people could do it for like skin tone of like brightening out faces and whatnot. But typically I find that just targeting, you know, skin tone um, uh, on the hue versus luma and bringing that up is sufficient in a lot of cases. Again, this isn't like the master master class of like the expert color grader and let's do all these nodes in DaVinci Resolve and go crazy and make it perfect and set up masks and tracking and all that stuff. I'm aware that all that exists and it's very valuable for the people who have time to do it and wanna put that effort in if that's what the project requires. However, there are many times where you just want a lot of projects, even if they're lower budget or they're quicker turnarounds to still look good. And I find this methodology to work really well for the majority of the stuff I work on. Again, it can be a little bit different for vlog with the GH5 and other cameras, but I do I do really enjoy color grading the Ursa Mini Pro footage because it just looks so nice. And also remember one thing that you shouldn't lose track of is most people who watch the final product, they're only going to criticize or have a problem if there is a, an obvious problem in the image. Most of the time, if there's nothing offensive, and by offensive I mean like something that's obviously a problem, they're gonna think it looks good if you did a decent enough job color grading it. It's very rarely that someone's gonna look at it and go, ooh, your, you know, your skin tones could have been 5% brighter or you know 5% darker. That's much more on like the technical, like artist side of things where like we all might talk that way, but just general audience viewer is probably not gonna nitpick that kind of stuff. They're gonna notice inconsistencies, like if shots don't match or if skin tones significantly change shot to shot, like brighter or darker. But in general, as long as you don't do anything wrong and nothing's offensive in the shot visually, like hurting their eyes, it's probably like your personal, like what you think looks good isn't really gonna matter to the end viewer who's, you know, oh, that should be cooler or warmer. They're just watching the piece of content, assuming that it's well produced, so as long as there's no problems, they're not gonna have an issue either. Hopefully that's helpful. 
I know it's a lot. I know it's not exactly the right, right way to do it. If you want that, start with Gerald's video. It is really good. It's why I made the lights in the background purple, just out of, uh, you know, just as a little homage to Gerald over there, at Gerald Undone. Uh, very valuable video for like the technical side of things, but I want to at least talk about how I sometimes do things in Premiere just for a little bit more of the uh, kind of creative quickness of grading on the fly as it relates to the Ursa Mini Pro. I know not everybody has the camera. People shoot with all sorts of things. I'm sorry if this doesn't work for you, but these tools are in Premiere for a reason and they are valuable. So maybe if it doesn't work for a log mode, it still can work for other modes, picture profiles on your camera and just fine tweaking and tuning colors. The curves are very valuable. Even in your basic correction, the highlight shadow, I find those to work really, really well, just straight out of the box in Premiere. So there's a lot of core, simple, quick functionality in Premiere that can work really, really well in a lot of situations. And then if you run into a problem, you can always make it more complicated from there. That was a lot of talking. And now I'm gonna pop over to the chat. I'm also gonna take a sip because my throat is getting very dry. I'm enjoying your teaching, always learning as a creative. Great, excellent. Uh, Cal says, hi, hi, I only grade in Scratch or DaVinci, but this looks interesting. Yeah, um, you, there are definitely more advanced uh, color programs, software. Premiere is an editor and it has color grading tools in it. And it's only recently that it's gotten a little bit more advanced uh, in similar ways to what Resolve has had for the longest time. I personally don't like the uh, Premiere editing dealing with Resolve for color. There's no good way to do it non-destructively that I found at least anyway. I know there's people who do maybe color first and so their color's done and then they edit everything, which is fine. Or there's people who export at the end, um, you know, either with an XML or an EDL or something like that where they bounce it out to Resolve for final color. I think both of those are valid in certain situations. I find though, a lot of times on a project, there isn't the clear process of like, okay, we're starting here, we're doing the edit, we've got picture lock, and now we're doing color. A lot of times it can be flexible, especially if you're going through revisions and it's a client project, or you just, you do a grade and then a couple days later you look at it and again, you're like, oh, that's not quite right, I wanna tweak that a little bit. I like the flexibility that's afforded by doing it all in Premiere so I can do it non-destructively and I'm not you know, exporting all of my footage, you know, if you do it at the beginning in Resolve and you export all your footage, now you have twice the, the file storage on your hard drive, which doesn't really make sense to me. And theoretically, you could delete all your raw stuff, but that would be a terrible idea because what if you don't like the color or someone wants to change the color later on? I always like having the raw stuff there. So if I was gonna do a Resolve workflow, I probably would do it at the end, but that can be cumbersome because you, you bounce the export and then, oh, actually we need to change an edit or something. And then are you changing it in Resolve? Because Resolve is an editor as well, but if you're comfortable with Premiere, specifically because of the integration with After Effects or something like that, and you just wanna be in the Adobe suite, it can be very complicated having to do multiple programs for multiple things. Works very well in kind of a traditional Hollywood film production where it's very designated of like the steps and the order of things. And when you have the resources to just buy insane amounts of hard drives and spend money on people to work on these things. But for a lot of independent people who are doing it all with themselves, it can be really taxing to have to bounce around with all these different uh, applications. And thankfully when, you know, the Ursa Mini Pro does come with Resolve uh, and there is the light version. So if you wanna play around with it, you definitely can. If you get something like an Ursa Mini Pro or even the Pocket Cinema camera, those will come with Resolve. So you have the tool if you need it, but oftentimes I enjoy the flexibility and the ease and simplicity of what can be done in Premiere. About four years ago, I left Premiere for Final Cut and then a year later switched full-time to Resolve. The color grading features were too compelling on Resolve to pass up. Absolutely, Trevor. I wish I, I, I wish I'd fallen in love with Resolve. Uh, I've tried over the years to get into it and, and appreciate it. There's just some stuff, I don't know if it's because I learned in Final Cut 7 or what, but it just doesn't click and seem intuitive in the same way that Premiere uh, does now, that they kind of adapted it to model more after Final Cut 7, the old, old, old days. And I honestly haven't ever opened up Final Cut X. 
I probably will at some point, maybe, but uh, Premiere does pretty much everything I would want it to do for the most part, aside from the advanced color uh, options. But I really enjoy the integration with After Effects as well. So it, it's just like cameras, we talk about it. It's like, what's the right camera for the job? That's kind of up to the individual design to decide. And what's the right editing software and color grading suite for the individual? It's it's really their choice in their workflow and the types of projects they're working on. There is no like, oh, do everything in Premiere because it's better at everything. No, in fact, I would say Premiere's not even all that great at a lot of things. Uh, but for me, the simplicity and just how like intuitive it is and kind of easy it is to access. But uh, I'll, maybe I'll give Resolve another chance here um, sometime in the future just to see if I could use it as an editor and see how that workflow feels. It's been... I want to say like three years since I opened Resolve last, and it was right, I think it was around, was it four, maybe 14 or 12, somewhere in that time period, where they were adding a lot of the kind of uh, editing features uh, and making it uh, more of like a traditional NLE. And I tried to get into it in that way, and it just didn't click. I love what they can do color-wise, but it's for me it's about the whole process as a kind of like this holistic package, as well as having something that people are familiar with as well. If you're working, you know, in, in team environments with a variety of editors, sometimes, you know, Adobe is kind of the standard for a lot of, a lot of reasons. And so people just feel very comfortable with it. So it's like trying to make the most of, of the tool you have, even though it might not be the perfect tool. Hopefully that makes sense. It's like, yes, this would be better in Resolve, but since we're limited to Premiere for other reasons, how can we optimize Premiere to get kind of close to what you can do in Resolve? Let's see, uh, Trevor says the level of fine control over selections, 3D tracking, color keying is so strong in Resolve. Absolutely, the only real drawback for me is that rendering times are much faster with Final Cut. Uh, if you're on a Mac, which in Final Cut you would have to be, uh, that is true. And then what cameras is footage from? Uh, in Premiere, everything I was editing was the Ursa Mini Pro. This stream is the GH5, depending on which one you're asking. Noise floor on your audio seems really high tonight, or am I hearing a laptop fan? It's probably my laptop fan. I apologize. Before I had the overhead boom that I just sounded really like roomy and noisy to me, I have the condenser mic and it should be closer to me technically, but I was just trying to keep it out of frame. But it is right here. There's a microphone right here and my laptop is sounds like it is gonna take off. So. I apologize if it's not uh, not quite perfect sounding, but it's good to know because I can't hear what it sounds like. So please let me know if anything looks or sounds weird. Thankfully, the way I did this stream tonight, my camera didn't freeze. I was having that issue the other night when I was in Premiere, although Premiere was locking up. I don't know what goes on when you start streaming with OBS, but Premiere just decides to, to stop, at least on my MacBook here. And then Trevor says I'm buffering a lot. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm buffering a lot. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's just the nature I think of trying to do all this stuff, uh, at the same time as streaming. Um, hopefully I, I, I thought I had it a little bit more optimized tonight, but maybe not. Uh, Louis says this was very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. And then Resolve also has Fusion integrated now too, and an audio tool as well. The buffering stop, by the way, I'm sure it's just when I'm over in Premiere, if I'm in Premiere trying to do all this stuff. I'm sure it it decides to uh, chug because I'm just like a lot of my shortcut like tools in Premiere like aren't even working right now. Like my keyboard and like, you know, uh, is not responding in the way it's supposed to. And I imagine it's just because there's so much going on. So yeah, all of this was the uh, Ursa Mini Pro footage, uh, ProRes, not raw with the uh, film profile. And I think it's one of the best ways to shoot, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, it's not the perfect way to shoot for every situation, but typically on the Ursa Mini Pro, I'm almost always shooting ISO 800, uh, almost always shooting around an F4. So most lenses, if they're zoom lenses, they're probably like a 2.8. If they're a prime, they're maybe like a 1.4, 1.8. In any case, on Super 35, I think F4 is like that nice balance between shallow depth of field but also stuff in focus. It can be less cinematic, I think, when you're shooting everything wide open. If everything's like a 1.4, it, 
and it's just like this long, you know, 85 millimeter lens shooting at a 1.4. It can just be like too shallow. And to me, that looks less cinematic. It looks more like amateur DSLR uh, style filmmaking from like 10 years ago. So I typically shoot at F4, ISO 800, 180 degree shutter always. And then, you know, 4K, 24, 60, depending on the, the nature of the footage. But that's, that's pretty much it. And then getting the white balance right. And the great thing about the Ursa is that when you set all that stuff, you know, F4, ISO 800, you have built-in NDs. So if it's too bright, you just click an ND over and you're good. And then sometimes you'll find the ND because they go in, in two stop increments that sometimes it's like the in-between stop that you really want. So that would be a situation where I would change my aperture to adjust either going to like a 5.6 if I need more depth of field or to a 2.8 if like the shallowness is fine for the situation. Really depends. But that if you're at F4, you can go 2.8 or 5.6, you know, as those one-stop increments. And then anything else outside of that would be, you know, NDs just to make sure that the exposure is good. And typically, there's always plenty of light. If you're using something like an Aperture 300D Mark II or the Godox lights, um, there's plenty of powerful lights out there that will, will give you enough. And then especially, too, if you're, you know, out in, in daylight, there's more than enough. So I typically am almost always shooting what would be, it technically is over for the Ursa, but as long as you're not blowing out and clipping the highlights, because I am shooting ProRes most of the time uh, for the uh, file sizes, for like long take recording type stuff, um, you know, the ProRes files, are, as long as you don't clip anything in your highlights, you're, you're fine, you have lots of room in your uh, grading. Let's see. Oh, by the way, Potato Jet canceled his R5 pre-order after the camera overheated in like 15 minutes. Yeah, I saw I saw his video uh, that he posted, and then Armando is keeping his to shoot 4K24, which seems crazy to me. I I don't understand. You can I I get a lot of hate, uh, and I, I I granted it's probably warranted. You know, like people think I'm just some guy on the internet complaining about cameras. That's fine totally valid, whatever. People can like the R5, they can like the R6. I just try and point stuff out in like a nuanced way and explain like, here's why it's an issue. Here's where I think Canon misled us. I think it is a shame they, they should have done a better job at least keeping the cameras cool. And then if they couldn't, because it was literally impossible with the technology they've implemented, then to do a better job communicating like the overheating status of the camera, because that also is very confusing. So trying to have these conversations and then people will just say like, oh no, it's for photography, it's great. If you want a video camera, go buy a cinema camera. It's like, it, it like misses the point because the R5 is not a cinema camera, but neither is the A7S III, neither is the S1H. I mean, the S1H you could argue is maybe a cinema camera, but no, it's really a hybrid. It, it takes photos, it does video, and there's plenty of companies that do it well. It's just somehow Canon always manages to have the most crippling features in their, in their cameras that you look at and you go, well, this, if this isn't, at this point, if it's not intentional, why would you want to support them anyway? You know, if it's intentional, if it's ignorance, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The issue is that it does overheat. And then people will point to, well, some people haven't had it overheat. I, someone, I know someone who shot with it and it didn't overheat. Great. Well, I'm not going to know that until I personally shoot with it. And then what? Do I have to take the risk and buy a $4,000 camera, a $2,500 camera to see if it overheats and if I want to send it back? Or I guess I could rent it. But why would I do that when for my needs, the A7S III is pretty much everything I would want from the R5 anyway? So I would much rather rent that one, test that one out, see if that one overheats, because chances are it probably won't, but I still want to see for sure, because some people have mentioned overheating on the A7S III could be an issue in certain circumstances. It's not like the R5 where it heats itself up. The R5 and the R6, like, you can just, the, them just being on, they just, they warm up to the point where they can't use their high-end modes. So the A7S III apparently doesn't have that issue, comes out very soon, rent it, test it out, see if it's the right camera, because at that point, the only thing the R5 does is the 8K RAW, which I probably wouldn't use all that often. It would be cool and neat to kind of do every once in a while, but the file sizes are just insane. The 4K 120 would be beneficial, but the A7S III does that. The only other thing is the on the photo side, the 45 megapixels, and while that would be nice, it's also not a deal breaker for me, 12 megapixels. I'm underwhelmed with, but it's that's not a deal breaker. It's not like it's it's abysmal and you can't 
do any kind of photography. You totally can with 12 megapixels. And if people are talking about, what's funny, in the R5 situation, people are saying, oh, you can shoot low, like the low quality 4K 30 and it won't overheat. And then all you have to do is just add sharpening in post and that fixes it, that fixes it right up. Those same people will criticize the A7S 3 for being 12 megapixels, which if it's 12 megapixels, you can just blow it up. You can add sharpening there too. So, and, and in fact, it's probably a much better version of that scenario considering there are gonna be raw images rather than you know line skipped 4K 30. So if adding sharpening is sufficient to make these people happy with the 4K 30 mode on the R5, they should be more than happy with the 12 megapixels on the A7S 3, at least from my, my perspective. Let's see, I rarely uh, shot at anything bigger than 1.8, I love 2.8 and f4. Yeah, I mean, it the the super shallow, you know, 1.4, 1.8, 1.2, 1.0, depending on the lens, I think that stuff is very valuable if you need it in certain low light situations. However, a lot of those lenses were from the time like like film, you know, that mentality of like, we need a really fast aperture because film ratings weren't nearly as powerful as what our, you know, ISOs are today where the A7S 3 can basically shoot in the dark and you can do high ISO with low noise. So you don't always need the super, super fast aperture. It's fun to use every once in a while. I think for portraits, it can be uh, nice and flattering depending on composition and subject and everything. So it definitely has this place, but I feel like it's more in photography and then certain use cases with video. If you're shooting video all the time at 1.4, I think you're probably one, not in focus, hardly ever, because uh, it's very, very challenging to do that, especially on a full frame camera like the A7S III. So using something more like F4, even 5.6 on a full frame camera, you'll have the blurry background, you know, you'll have the bokeh, it'll be there. It might not be as extreme, but it'll be there and you'll have the nice, crisp, sharp detail where your subject is actually in focus. In fact, one of the things about my setup here is that this is wide open and it really freaks me out that I'm you know, going in and out of focus and that being distracting. So it's just kind of the, the nature of it. I think it is less cinematic to shoot wide open and you're also not getting the best performance out of the lens if you're shooting wide open either. David asks, uh, I'm curious if you've heard of the Z-Cam brand cameras. Personally, I think it's a very underrated camera. David, funny enough, I've talked about the Z-Cam a few times. Um, I have a couple videos talking about it. I haven't personally used it myself, but it looks very, very interesting. The Z-Cam F6 and the S6 both look like fantastic cameras. And I just found out, which is really cool, the EF mount for the Z-Cams has a a slot where you can put electronic NDs in there. Apparently, they don't ever go clear, so it is a situation where once you put it in, you do lose at least one stop, which may be fine depending on the, what, you're, what you're using, and you can always take it out. But good to know that there is an EF mount with electronic ND, uh, kind of not built in, but like swappable, so you can put it in or take it out as you need it, which is a cool feature I didn't realize when I first looked at those cameras. Trevor says, Manny Ortiz had his overheat while shooting B-roll for his YouTube video. He seriously did not look happy. He loves it for photography. Yeah, I mean, the R5 and the R6 would be great if you're just doing photography, but a lot of people who are looking at these cameras are looking at it for the video features because Canon, I don't wanna say they hyped it, because if you say they hyped it, people freak out and they say, Canon didn't hype it, it was all the rumors. Canon marketed the camera based on the video capabilities as well as it being a worthy B cam for cinema shooters. They said this, this is they put it out there. And so if it overheats after 15 minutes of B roll, that's not reliable. It might be a beautiful image. It might have great autofocus, good stabilization, the best lenses in the business, could be. But if the camera does not work, like it like doesn't do the mode you need, <laughs> you have to turn it off for it to cool down. Cause even if you put it in a lower mode, it's still not cooling down. You have to actually turn it off. You have to incapacitate the camera to get it back functioning. You've basically lost all the benefits because there are no benefits when the camera is off. 
It seems like the Joker movie was shot at 2.8 and bigger apertures. What do you think about that look? I think it can be valuable in certain um, uh, certain films or certain shows that you know use very shallow depth of field or they're using you know, really uh, fast apertures. I think it can be distracting, honestly, if there's so much blur in an image. There's so much bokeh. It's just so shallow with these really tight shots and you... It's very dreamy, and it can be, you know, in in the immediate, like, when the 5D Mark II came out and people finally had access to this kind of stuff, everyone, yeah, everyone was shooting 1.2 on full frame for video, and it got so overplayed to the point, just like sliders, like, if you have a slider and every shot in your piece is a slider, uh, slider shot, it's just like, it's, it's kind of overdone, um, and I would say there's a time and a place for super shallow depth of field. But a lot of times, if you look at at cinema, some of like the the staples of like what what looks like film, a lot of times there's a fairly deep depth of field where you see a lot because someone built a set, you know, someone did wardrobe and you have actors and extras and you have all this stuff that you want to see because people put time, effort, and energy into it and, and you know dollars, right? The budget was spent on building a whole set and filling it with extras. If you're shooting at a 1.4 and all of that's just blur then what was the value of it? What was the point? And then is that even communicate really to a viewer who's watching it? Are they going to really understand what's happening? A lot of times they can in a piece like Joker where it's basically focused on just his character following him the whole time. I can see that being kind of more of like an intimate vibe where you feel like it's more more of that personal shallow depth of field. We're really close. Everything else is blurry. It's just about him. But I think honestly, a lot of times it's it's too easy of a crutch to rely on for a lot of people where they just shoot wide open all the time and it adds a certain feeling that is less intentional than something where you can see and there's context for what's happening, what the space looks like, what the background is. It's still going to be blurry. It's still going to have bokeh. Don't get like, I like that look. Don't get me wrong. I like shallow depth of field. But it's that point where it's just so shallow and all that's in focus is an eyelash. And the moment the person moves and it's out of focus, it's done. There's a, a really annoying scene in Interstellar. I think it's uh, Michael Caine's character. If you haven't seen Interstellar, there's not really much to spoil. But uh, Michael Caine, he dies you know, halfway through the film. And his death scene is all out of focus. It's really distracting. And I saw it in IMAX at the time. And the whole time I'm like, why... I'm rubbing my eyes. I'm like, am I am I losing my vision? What's going on here? Why is this whole scene blurry? And I don't know if it was just like the one take they did, if it was just that his acting was better in that one. So it was like more important to, to sacrifice the technical side of things of, well, it's not in focus, but people won't notice. Like, I don't know. I just found it very distracting where the rest of the film, there's a lot that's like sharp and clear and in focus. So it wasn't an issue with the projector, wasn't an issue with my eyes. I'm just watching this like really emotional you know, important scene, and, you know, it's this character dying, and it's all out of focus, and not intentionally, not like, you know, super blurry, it's just like, not quite in focus, and I go, oh man, if only, if only it had been not so shallow, maybe it could have been, been in focus there, I don't know, I can't criticize too hard, obviously, you know, professional filmmakers are doing their thing, and mistakes, things are going to happen, and a lot of it is, uh, maybe unavoidable or like you, you realize after the fact and oh you can't do reshoots because of budgets and I get all that so it's not like hate or you know extreme criticism of like the movie's bad because this one shot's out of focus but it is distracting and I, I uh, try and avoid that as much as possible let's see what's happening in the chat David says what's your opinion on the Nikon Z cameras for hybrid shooters I am not a fan of Nikon I don't think they do enough in terms of catering to uh, video people, so I just don't really... Um, they always seem like they're late to the game. They're a photography company, and uh, it, it, it shows. I, and I don't blame them for it, because they're not coming out saying our cameras do 8K RAW and 4K 120, and then they're overheating. They're just saying, yeah, like we do you know, 4K 30. And you're like, okay, great. You know, like I don't, I don't know what to say. Like it's not bad. It's not, but it's it's nice to have, I suppose, if you're into uh, photography and you want a camera and you like Nikon and you have Nikon lenses. And but for me, uh, I'm much more a fan of uh, Sony and Panasonic. 
Bart says, what up, Strons? Hey, Bart, how's it going? Trevor says, noon cameras are fine and actually shoot really nice video. Noon cameras? What are noon cameras? They're just fighting from behind. They have great ergonomics at a great price and very, very good glass. Uh, what are noon cameras? Are fine and actually shoot really nice video. I don't, is that supposed to be the Nikon Z? Nikon cameras are fine and actually shoot really nice video. I assume that's Nikon, but noon, noon would be kind of a cool name for a camera company, I suppose. Bart owns a Z cam. Uh, he can tell you some stuff. And then Bart says, he's got the Z cam F6. Excellent. Uh, I was looking at the F6 and the S6 from Z cam. I can pull those up if we want to take a peek. Again, if you haven't watched it, Gerald's video, very, very uh, informative on log and color grading from the technical side of things. But let's look at the Z cam. E2 F6. I was specking one of these out on B&H and I had it in the cart and I was like, you know what? I have the Ursa Mini Pro. I don't, this doesn't, I don't need this. Um, and that's the funny thing. It's like, it, I like the size of the Z cam because it is smaller, uh, but to rig it out with a monitor, a grip, uh, I'd have to get the ND um, insert, which is cool. I do, I do like that they have that as a feature, but like, it's basically like a Nursa Mini Pro or a, a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. I think they all kind of function similarly in that cheap, affordable cinema camera is, is what this is. What I'm really looking for right now is definitely what Sony's offering with the A7S III, something that does photography as well. I think the Z cam looks great if you don't have a cinema camera and you want cinema style footage. Uh, for me, the Ursa Mini Pro is fantastic and I love it. Uh, I think it the footage looks phenomenal. Using it is really easy and intuitive. Best menu system, hands down, I've ever used on any camera. So there's so many, it has my my vote and, and the pocket cinema camera for that matter, uh, aside from some battery limitations there, but those are all fixable and you can get around it. And the pocket cinema 6K, the only thing you can't do is the um, ND situation, but maybe they'll come out with a new upgraded version that has some kind of NDs either in the mount or you can swap stuff in like the Z cam, I don't know what they'll do, but you know, $2,000 and you can shoot 6K uh, up to 50 frames a second, like for $2,000. That's, it's, the, the pocket cinema camera is such a, a steal <laughs> for anyone who, if you don't have anything, right? Now, is it, it's arguable that like, if you have something like a GH5S or an S1H or an A7S II or something, I could see why you might not gravitate towards the pocket cinema camera because like yes it might be better in some ways but you might also be sacrificing something else that you already have so i get it but if you have literally nothing a pocket cinema camera for a super 35 cinema camera that can shoot 6k at 50 frames a second like for two thousand dollars that's it's incredible granted you have to rig it out a little bit with some better battery solutions and it doesn't have the flip screen, but the screen that is on it is beautiful. It's, it's massive. And the menu system is super easy and intuitive to use. Everything about it's great. And you can record right to a SSD, you know, over USB-C if you uh, want to rig it out that way. So I, I think Blackmagic does a great job and I'm really excited to see what they have next after the Ursa Mini 12K. Like hopefully they keep expanding the pocket cinema line because they're uh, fantastic cameras. Uh, let's see. Uh, Trevor says, noon is autocorrected Nikon. Yeah, okay, glad, glad I figured that out. I was like, what is he talking about? Oh, Bart is Bart is the one who commented about the END for the Z cam. Yes, thank you for turning me on to that. That's an uh, incredible feature, and I wish more... Like, that's the point to me of having those big like adapters or like if you're not putting a mirror in the camera right if it's not a dslr and there's no mirror mirror box but it's still like an ef mount you have all this room you know that flange distance is massive put something in there an nd filter makes a lot of sense 
So I'm glad that Zcam took that approach. Uh, Trevor says, I love the image from that camera and it's so, so light. Which camera? The Nikon or the Zcam? And then Bart says, I lost my Ursa Mini in a fire last year. Oh no, that's awful. I'm sorry to hear that. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have gone Zcam. I also have a Pocket 4K and 6K. Wow, which do you like the best from the Zcam and the Pocket 4K and the 6K? I'd be curious from someone who has all three. Uh, also doesn't overheat, yeah. No 6K ProRes on the Blackmagic either. It's all raw. That is a downside uh, for sure that the ProRes isn't. Uh, you can't do 6K ProRes. Um, but if you're doing raw and like that's one of the reasons you're buying the camera, like then you get that benefit. Otherwise, you're shooting 4K. And then David says, after this, I feel like going for Sony a7S III and a 24 to 728. I mean, yeah, like that's going to be a great combination uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the Sony, the a7S III just looks for almost, for my purposes, and most people, I think nowadays, if you're making content, video content for weddings, commercials, corporate stuff, personal stuff for YouTube. Uh, like there's so many good reasons like why an A7S III would work really well. The only limitation is on the photography side if you need more than 12 megapixels. But if you're that person, you, you probably already have a photography camera that does more than 12 megapixels. And I imagine if you found yourself where you needed that, you probably would have multiple cameras with you anyway. Like if you are doing a wedding or something, you'd probably have an A7S III for the low light, but you probably have like an A7 R4 or something like that for your you know high res, like, oh, it's daylight and we can and just take some, some portraits or whatever it is. You know, I think it's like, if you want the all-in-one that's what the R5 should have been, and the R6 for that matter, if they didn't have the overheating limitations. Those would be great all-around cameras too. It's like the Sony a7S III, video feature-wise, incredible. Does everything right. They finally updated things, even things like the flip screen, the menus, they've like fixed so many of the problems that the Sonys have, that they were problems necessarily, but they were limitations. Get, they've gone 10-bit, that's fantastic. They've got 4K 120. So the video is phenomenal on the A7S III. It's just the photos. You're a little bit limited where you're not, you know, you don't have 45 megapixels, but you have 12 and you go, okay, that's fine. On the Canon side, you have great photo features, but then the video mode that you want, like just does not work. <laughs> and the one that you can use is 4K 30, which people have had for a long time now. I mean, even the, what is it? Like the EOS R, I'm pretty sure you can just do 4K 30, it might, although it might be cropped. I'm not sure what the implementation is exactly on the EOS R, but it's like there's nothing cutting edge about the video side of things. So I guess maybe that's the equivalent of 12 megapixels. I don't know how you how you compare those. It just seems odd to me that I, I get that the Canons are great for, for photo, but it seems like the A7S III, you know, 12 megapixels. Yeah, it's, it's not a lot, but it's something. At least you can use it all the time. It's not like the photo mode locks you out and says, oh, now you can't take raw photos anymore. You've got to wait, let it cool down, turn the camera off, and then come back to take your photos again. That's kind of ridiculous. Bart says, I have full frame EF glass, so I speed boost the Pocket 4K to Super 35, okay. But I find myself using the Pocket 6K most been experimenting a lot with the Z cam, but I've been used to the Blackmagic color and exposure since the 4.6. Gotcha. All right, interesting. I'd be curious to hear more about the Z cam and your experience with it. I'm amazed on what Sony's doing with their cameras. It's interesting to see a mirrorless photography camera more focused on video than photography, although it seems to be a great all around camera. And that's the case with the Panasonic S1H. I mean, that is primarily a video hybrid. You know, it's a, it's a photography camera that's basically been maxed out to do some of the best video uh, features that, you know, up until, you know, the A7S III, which technically isn't even out yet, like the S1H wins kind of hands down across all, all avenues, aside from autofocus. But if you're talking about just video features for someone who wants to shoot video, the S1H does pretty much everything you would want, aside from, you know, 4K 120, which now the A7S III is adding, so I imagine that would just be the future of what Panasonic implements on things like the GH6 or the S2 or the S2H, whatever it becomes. 
Bart says, good to see you back online, by the way. All of a sudden, you started blowing up my feed. Ah, uh, well, yes. Yeah, I decided to uh, get back into YouTube, doing it a little bit more regularly. Uh, I enjoy it. It's fun hanging out on these streams and making the content. That's, I mean, it's just how I make the content anyway. I just talk to the camera. I cut it up. I put it out there. If, if someone finds it helpful, great. If not, no sweat. You can go watch something else that's more highly produced. I just don't have the time in the day to like do just YouTube high quality, like as much as I would want to make, you know, high quality, compelling videos. It's like, I, I do that for work and, and other projects that are more content focused. So to do it for my YouTube channel seems like a, a waste of time almost, um, considering the, you know, the effort that goes into it and then to get, you know, oh, it got a thousand views and it's like, great. I just spent 40 hours on that, you know, like that, uh, that if I was doing something else, I probably would do that. But because my job is photo and video all the time, I much prefer this format of just being it being easy, being able to make content, put it out there, talk about cameras, explain stuff, some of what I do, why I do it. Um, and then because it, it helps me too when I you know hear stuff about, oh, the Z cam, it has the electronic ND you know, slot in thing. It's like, oh, that's cool. I didn't even know that. And the only reason I found that out is because I talked about the Z cam and then Bart's the one that mentioned it saying like, hey, by the way, you should know about this, which is fantastic. So I enjoy making the YouTube content. I enjoy doing these live streams, but it is also like a lot of work to do anything beyond this, which I, you know, the people who do, and they, and they make these awesome videos that we all enjoy, right? We all get to watch YouTube content and see the, the camera tests and the, the technical breakdowns. And like, if you've ever done it and made videos like that, it's so much work because everyone is like the toughest critic because you're talking to other professionals who are like, oh, that's not how you do the test. Oh, hope you messed that up. Oh, you really need to use this. And so like, even if you try your hardest doing the best you have with what you have, someone out there always has a better setup, a better way. And they'll say, Oh, you're just a, you know, Sony fanboy, or oh, you just like Panasonic Canon's the best or whatever. And it's like, okay, okay. Well then like, why, you know, I, I feel for the people who put so much time, effort and energy into their YouTube content. Uh, I personally just don't have the time right now to focus on that kind of stuff um, in a way that maybe I would like to, but also it's just not a priority right now. Now I'd rather do, kind of the way, the way I've always done video content in that um, simplicity of just talking. It's a type of content I like to consume as well, just people just talking, having conversations. I know I'm talking to myself uh, right now, but uh, I enjoy I enjoy listening to other people talk, share their thoughts, so uh, I kind of enjoy doing the same as well from the creation side of things. David says, I don't know if they have told you this, but you look like a a little like Peter M, Peter McKinnon. I just rather watch your videos. Ha! <laughs> um, there definitely is a, a, a thing there that uh, we share a few uh, traits. I also have seen some people saying that I look like a young Liam Neeson. They clicked on a thumbnail thinking it was a young Liam Neeson. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's a thing. It's it's funny the way you see yourself versus other people. Cause the Peter McKinnon thing, I totally get. Uh, and it's funny cause he just has gotten big on YouTube. Oh, what's it been over the past four or five years? You know, he hasn't been this like staple that's been around for a long time in the same way that like Philip Bloom has. Philip Bloom, you know, blew up with the 5D Mark II. And so it's just always been around. But then uh, Pete just like off the charts, just, you know, millions and millions of subscribers, um, very successful. And then he's got his little crew that he works with as well. Um, if people click on my videos thinking I'm Peter McKinnon, that's totally fine by me. Uh, I think we, uh, you, we've, it's interesting cause like our channels are about the same, the same age, uh, in terms of like how old they are. I think his ones may be technically a little older than my channel, but I don't, uh, I don't intentionally try and look like Peter McKinnon. This is just how I look. <laughs> uh, Bart says I have my YouTube channel. Sometimes it's tough. Yeah, I mean, it's the the camera side of things, reviewing cameras, doing the test, like what Gerald does with his, his videos, it is a lot of effort. Uh, and I imagine he has a whole team working on that stuff. If he does it all himself, even more props, that's incredible. Uh, but thankfully, I imagine he's also able to do it just, that's like all he does, uh, I imagine. 
Uh, I don't actually know that for a fact, but it's tough to balance. You know, if you want to, you got to start somewhere. And if you're starting small, you know, which everyone does at the very beginning, you have to balance that of like, okay, what's, how much am I putting towards work? How much am I putting towards family? How much am I putting towards myself? I mean, the reason I stream this late at night, depending on where you are, I suppose, but it's late for me, is just because it's like my family's asleep. You know, my my boys are to bed. If they don't wake up, which they usually don't, you know, I can stream and my wife is sleeping as well. So it's my like time to do this because the rest of the day, it's either family or it's work, uh, fixing stuff around the house, d- doing, doing projects, doing work, um, doing shoots, editing, that kind of stuff. So this is just... Uh, me time and I get to spend it with you all which is always enjoyable as well Bart says he met Peter at NAB he does a segment on one of my videos where he stole my camera good dude that's awesome that's always fun to like bump into other people that's what I missed about this year of there not being NAB I was planning on going because if you've been following my channel for some time you'll know that uh, I've done the NAB live stream twice now three times Um, I think twice, but I wanted to do something like that again, but like kind of make it a a little bit better than some of the implementations in the past. So, oh yeah, runs with scissors says it's 530 in New Zealand. So perfect timing. Great for all the, uh, New Zealanders. What are you Kiwis? Is that the, uh, is that the, is that the term? Uh, perfect time for New Zealand. That's excellent. Well, here in Arizona, it is quite late, but, um, but yeah. A good time for me. Anyway, at NAB, I really wanted to go, but obviously with everything going on, NAB got canceled. And so kind of a shame, kind of a bummer, because I was really looking forward to it this year. I think it would have been incredible had some of these things been announced, you know, during that week with Canon, with Sony, maybe announcements from Panasonic. 2020 in like another timeline and another dimension is like the best year ever for like cameras and, and excitement Because not only would we have incredible tools, but there would be far more just productions happening as well, because I know a lot of that has been shut down too. So you've got this like, what could have been an amazing year becomes this kind of like, well, we're all kind of getting through it sort of year. And NAB was just another one of the things like, like many of the other that got taken out this year, which is unfortunate. You live streamed all of NAB. I was there that year and we were trying to find you. <laughs> uh, raw or Rec 709 for controlled environment situations. Ooh, I mean, Rec 709, like when you say Rec 709, are you talking just like about like a linear profile? Because if you're asking for like the GH5, how I currently have it set, it's in Cine like V. This isn't, uh, you know, a LUT on a log profile or anything like that. It's Cine like V. With the GH5, I shoot that way a lot. If I have. Uh, problems with, you know, dynamic range, I might switch to V-Log, but probably those are also situations where I'd be using the Ursa instead anyway. And with the Ursa, I always shoot with the film mode. I don't ever shoot video or video extended. Uh, I just don't see the reason to, because I'm going to do color grading anyway at some point, even if it's minor, or if it's just like a one pass, like slap something on there and be done with it. I just like the way the film mode, the kind of log mode on the Ursa Mini looks. And so I would almost always do that. Now, if you're talking about like ProRes versus RAW, that depends. Um, I usually shoot ProRes most of the time for just like saving space on hard drives and whatnot, because a lot of it is long form recording. If it was more of like a commercial and they're short clips, I would probably do RAW. But for long form interviews, uh, documentary style stuff, it's almost always ProRes just because it's it's a little bit more economical on the... uh, the cards and, you know, storage and whatnot. Trevor says, I'll never understand the YouTube animal. I think Bloom should have as many followers as McKinnon. His content is so polished. Yeah. I, I, Pete uh, appeals to people who aren't, you know, professionals as well. And I think that's really the secret of his success is that he was able to make cameras and all this stuff appeal to the people who, you know, want to just have fun with a GoPro and want to do cool cool shots when they're traveling, but they're not necessarily professionals either. And he does a really good job turning that into, you know, compelling stories with good edits, sound design, the whole package, you know, beautiful imagery. Um, and he's just like a enjoyable guy to watch as well. He's got a good personality on camera. 
So the way the the package that he's put together around himself is very smart uh, for mass appeal to a, to a broad audience. Where uh, Philip seems to more appeal to professional type people, the same way that like Curtis Judd or uh, Caleb Pike or like these people who cater to the the audience that is looking for the technical specifications of a camera rather than just like look at this dope shot of someone doing something cool and incredible um, in the way that like Pete's content is more of, of that style entertainment. There's definitely overlap and gray area between between the two, but there's like a mass appeal that Peter McKinnon has that uh, a lot of the other people don't because it's not their passion. They're more passionate about the the equipment and the, the technical side of things where uh, Pete seems more, and he's like a photographer too. So that's that's even the other layer of it that he approaches everything like doing video as secondary to taking photos, which if you just think about it, almost everybody is a photographer in some sense. They have a smartphone in their pocket and they wanna know how to take good good photos. That diminishes as people get into video, which is less of a common thing. Yeah, people are doing videos for Instagram and whatnot, but there's not very many people comparatively. I bet there's a, lot, a far more people editing photos than editing videos. Because even if you're you know, just like an Instagram influencer or a blogger or something like that, you're gonna be taking photos into Lightroom. You're gonna be editing them, you're gonna be doing something. But it's a handful of people that then take that to YouTube and then they're editing videos. So if you cater to the photography side of things, I think that's just a broader audience in general. And then it trickles down to video. And then from there it gets like the more techie, detailed, gear oriented it is. It's just a smaller audience by the nature of it. Uh, a lot of people tag on him because he shoots a lot of slow-mo, so what? I don't get it. Uh, is that uh, Peter McKinnon you're talking about? Just ragging on him because he shoots a lot of slow-mo? Slow-mo looks awesome. I shoot a lot of slow-mo because it looks good. Uh, I'll never fault somebody for shooting slow-mo. <laughs> uh, Bart says, I love Bloom stuff. He's a pro spending time answering questions pros have. Yeah, and Curtis Judd is another one who not a, I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but from like the audio side of things, uh, his videos are very, very well done. Um, David says, oh yeah, maybe I want to know what image profile do you recommend for what? With the GH5, I, I personally, you know, recommend Cinelec V. It's what I shoot with almost all the time. I just like the way it looks. Uh, I don't, I, compared to Cinelec D or Vlog or uh, HLG, all these different modes, I think Cinelec V looks the best. It looks the most cinematic while also looking the most normal and natural. Uh, which is why I'm using it here. If you don't like how this looks, then you can disagree with that. And maybe, you know, maybe there's something about this image that is off-putting to you. Let me know what it is. But with the GH5, I would do Cinelite V. On the Ursa Mini, I would definitely do the film mode just because it grades so, so well. Uh, so that that's my recommendations based off the cameras I'm currently using. I rarely shoot raw. Uh, ProRes, that's a sweet spot. Yeah. ProRes is really, really flexible. There's a lot of uh, hype that's around RAW and the ability to do it because it is so powerful. However, there are many, many instances where you don't actually need it and the benefits don't outweigh the high cost of doing it. So if what you're doing needs that extra dynamic range and you're gonna do heavy, heavy color grading, then yeah, shoot RAW. But if you can contain the whole dynamic range in the scene, which oftentimes you can in the Ursa Mini just because it's an it's incredible camera, really, for the price point as well. And you can record that right to ProRes and you can edit smoothly, seamlessly. Uh, I think it works really well. Um, but RAW has its place as well. It's not a one or the other where you have to do it one way or you, you never use ProRes or only do RAW or whatever. I just tend to find ProRes being really nice for long form stuff where you want to be able to record, you know, on a card or two throughout the day and you're not going through your entire set of cards, dumping them because you're recording so much raw. And then you have all this raw footage for a project that once it's done, if you're the type of person that just deletes stuff, then maybe that's okay with you. But I've, I don't ever delete my original source material content. So it just doesn't seem 
a lot of times the on the storage side of things, the cost of saving raw files permanently um, and having them redundant, you know, with a RAID system or a, a backup offsite kind of thing or cloud storage, however you go about doing it, it's just really cost prohibitive in a lot of situations to shoot raw. But there are many times where it makes sense in the same way that like, I mean, photography, the raw, I almost always shoot raw for photos just because it's not that big of files and I'm not taking, you know, hundreds of thousands of photos uh, in a session. So I'll do raw for the benefits there on, on the photography side because it is worth it. But for video, you know, when you're talking about doing like 120 frames, do you want to do that raw? Like every second, you have 120 frames every second. You know, you're probably recording for minutes at least and in some cases hours. That's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of individual like raw images that make up your video that's a lot of data to then, you know, sift through for the sake of, oh, I got my highlights back, you know, a little bit. It's like, well, you could have just exposed properly and gotten them with ProRes too. Pete is also big in photography and Instagram. Philip is very much more pro video. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what I talked about. Uh, Bloom is an outstanding storyteller. I like watching his mini docs. I don't, I mean, like watch them both. I mean, they're both, like the content is free on YouTube, but like watch them both. Um, and if you don't like somebody else, fine. You don't have to watch me either. Uh, I like uh, Vlog and Natural on the GH5. Uh, very nice. David, yeah, your image looks really nice. I'm curious on your opinion about adding film grain or noise for certain short films, projects, etc. This was the trend uh, 10 years ago to like add grain uh, to your, 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 uh, videos. I think that so much of it gets lost in compression typically that it can be more of a headache to manage getting the final look you want. Cause you might add noise or grain and then you go to export it and it doesn't look right. And then you have to reconfigure your settings, check your bit rate, do all this stuff. Uh, it can be valuable in certain situations to fix problems like banding. Adding some noise can help fix all that. Like with, you know, it's basically dithering, but in general, I don't add noise or, or grain or anything like that to, to the image. Uh, I kind of like it more clean, but um, I will do sharpening like I showed in Premiere. I'll sharpen it a little bit if it's the Ursa. If it's a GH5, I typically don't sharpen that because it's already very sharp to begin with. Bart says, I do miss my Ursa Mini. I hope they dial back from the 12K and just put the Super 35 sensor from the Pocket 6K in an Ursa body and we get ProRes and higher frame rates with all that processing and cooling. Oh, that'd be interesting. Kind of like an in-between, like an upgrade from the Pocket, but not quite the 12K. Although the 12K does look uh, very nice. And I imagine you can get a Gen 1 Ursa now because uh, that's probably the one I would get, right? You could get the Gen 2, um, which is also good. That's what this one is. It's a Gen 2. But... Um, Either one, the Gen 1 or the Gen 2, uh, or some Mini Pro, valid. And then if you have the money to get the 12K, probably go that route, because then you get all the additional frame rates as well for not just 12K, but for 8K and 6K, et cetera. I'm going to take it. I'm, get, I'm just like th so thirsty tonight. As I all the talking about color, color grading, and then just wore, wore my voice out, I think. So thankfully, usually I don't have any kind of like beverage to sip on because I know it, it may be like clinks or it's a distraction. I don't know if that's obnoxious or not. Probably less obnoxious than the fan noise from my laptop. So I got to figure that out. Maybe I'll pull this microphone up and I'll just deal with it in frame. I just don't, I something about that look. I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll trick myself into, into, into enjoying it because really this microphone should be closer. It is a condenser microphone uh, for that kind of podcast sound. But, uh, and then it would be further away from the laptop, which is making an awful lot of noise because it's a MacBook Pro and they just kind of run loud. It is what it is. Maybe I could close Premiere. That'd probably be a good idea. Maybe I'll do that. Close this out. But I wonder, hopefully that doesn't break OBS. We'll see. Fingers crossed. All right, back in the chat. Uh, Bart says film grain was a trend 10 years ago, removes film grain effect from current project. <laughs> I mean, when we're talking about like digital video cameras and everything was 1080p and how do we make it look like film? How do we make it look like film? How do we make it look like film? If you like the look of film grain, put it on there. Like, and it's no, no problem. I think there was a time where I worried more about it 
Uh, and then now I kind of just let it, let it be what it is. Um, it's the same thing that like, there are certain optimizations you can make, but then like, what if you put film grain on your video and you forget it for like a few frames, right? Cause you have to overlay it. And so like, what if you forget it for a few frames or then like there's a, a gap and it's not there or it's not there at the very end or, you know, it's a, like, there's problems that can come from that of like inconsistency. And then you're like double checking to make sure you have film grain and like, and then you export a video. And you're like, I forgot to add film grain to this one. I try and keep my workflow and process simple and streamlined for my own sanity. And often 99% of the time, no one else notices, no one else cares. They're not looking at it and going, oh, this would be better with film grain. They're just go, oh, it looks nice, you know, or whatever. So I, I, I guess I probably focus and prioritize on like more important things from my perspective. But if the film grain look is really important to you, I wouldn't say it's wrong. Uh, I just, I just don't, I don't value it in the same way that I maybe did uh, 10 years or so ago when I was like, oh, it's got to look like film. It's got to look like film. Nothing looks like film anymore because hardly anything is. You know, most, I think, I think what was it? I think I watched Prometheus. A terrible movie. I don't like Prometheus, but breathtaking visuals, like so sharp and clean uh, in the, in, when I saw it in the theater that it like, it was the first film I saw that I was like, I'm glad there's not grain. I'm glad it is clean and beautiful and sharp and detailed with all this resolution. Shot on red, I forget which red cameras they shot Prometheus on. Uh, it might have been the dragon at the time or something around, maybe a little bit after. But watching that, I really appreciated just how clean the image was. And that was the first time I remember thinking like, I don't really need film grain. And then now with YouTube and digital content and Netflix and Disney Plus and all these all these things, people are just so familiar seeing a variety of content. So as long as it looks good in terms of like the color, dynamic range, it's a good edit, good sound design, you're doing some slow-mo in there, here or there to like kind of make it, you know, that cinematic vibe. I think people are are very, they're not as hypercritical as maybe they once were of like, this doesn't look like film. It looks like digital. It looks bad. I think people are far more embracing and accepting of, of the digital look, even if there is one, which I don't know that there is anymore. Any documentaries that you should watch? Um, I don't know why I thought of it, but... <clears throat> sorry, one second. Uh, it just came to mind, there's a documentary, Dogtown and Z-Boys. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Uh, Dogtown... And Z-Boys, I'm typing with one hand, so it's a little slow. Dogtown Z-Boys is about kind of like this group of uh, skateboarders who kind of kicked things off in, uh, what was it, the, the 70s in Santa Monica? Yeah, mid-70s skateboarding. It's, a, it's really well done. Um, one of the one of the guys, uh, Stacy Peralta, like he went on to be a filmmaker docu documentarian, and so he's the one that put it together. Uh, but he's one of the the skaters from that time. So really cool, um, just fun. I mean, it came out in what, 2001. So I don't even, I don't know if there's an A, there, I don't know if it's a 16 by nine or if it's four by three or if there's an HD version. Um, they made the movie Lords of Dogtown shortly thereafter, but I recommend the documentary first because I just think it's really interesting. I just watched The Last Dance, which is a, uh, very satisfying to watch. I think it's very well put together based on the crazy amount of footage they have of the Chicago Bulls. Uh, that's on Netflix. You could watch that right now if you wanted. I also really like, you know, Making a Murderer. I think that's very well done and put together from like a, a narrative standpoint. I also really like Tiger King. I think that's put together and is a, a compelling story. I like the docu-series rather than like a standalone documentary, which Dogtown and Z-Boys is a, a one and done but I kind of like the, the series approach to both fiction and nonfiction content. Uh, Bar says, don't worry, I wasn't actually adding it, but Film Convert does have some nice grains. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, check out the RTX noise canceling, really good, but I think your audio sounds pretty good. Oh, excellent, uh, I can check that out. Grain also hides imperfections in your image, really, but since the sensors and color science have gotten so much better, I rarely use it now. Yes, yes. Uh, and then I have a question, a GH5 user here, trying to get an EOS RP for low light and autofocus, but I'm worried about 8-bit color coming from the GH5's 10-bit. Am I over worrying? 
I film wedding, by the way. Um, it depends. If you're shooting with a color profile built in, so on the 5D, that would be something like uh, they have uh, portrait, landscape, standard, you know, just the normal color profiles. Like linear color, it's got saturation, it's got contrast. 8-bit, totally fine. You don't have to worry about it. It's just if you're shooting log, which I don't even know if the RP does log. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I don't really look at the RP. Um, but if it's got a log mode and you want that, or like you want to do low contrast, low saturation, so you can grade after the fact, that's where 10-bit is going to be more helpful because you actually have that information there. Whereas if it's 8-bit, it, it can just be like there's not enough data with that the, the color being so desaturated and so uh, low contrast it can be a, a pain to color so it depends on how you're shooting but if you're shooting with a, a built-in picture profile you're probably fine uh, with 8-bit and, and everything gets exported as 8-bit anyway so if you're if you're not doing heavy color grading 8-bit should do you just fine IMAX 3D Prometheus in theaters was like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see it in 3D. I'm not a huge fan of the 3D, but uh, Prometheus did look very, very beautiful on the big screen. Just wait until we eventually have H.264 artifacts filters to make videos feel more vintage. I'm sure that already probably is a thing. You can probably make you make your footage look, yeah, make it compressed, uh, all blocky, like uh, like in the 2000s. It was so, so cool. Do you think 30 frames... Uh, per second or higher frame rate movies would ever become more common no they tried that with the hobbit films and people i think there's probably some stories of individuals throwing up but in general people just don't like it i don't like it i think it works for video games because you're looking at something that is artificial when you're looking at a movie or a person there is a the the like lack of motion blur that you get with high frame rate stuff is it looks really odd, I think, considering in real life you see motion blur. Like if you wave your hand in front of your face, you should hopefully see motion blur right now. Uh, life is blurry from motion. Things that move fast are blurry to the eye. So in film, like 24, while it might not be like perfect in exactly what the human eye sees, we've gotten so used to it and accustomed to it, I think anything different looks kind of fake and cheap um, by comparison. So... I, I, I think they already tried it and it kind of failed. Uh, bro, S1H. Yeah, S1H is great. Uh, fantastic. Um, like how we have Super 8 looks. Yes. For how long you guys have been streaming? Uh, I don't know. How long has the stream been going? Almost two hours is what it says. So if you want the color grading portion, that's all at the beginning. I intentionally do it right at the beginning. So if someone watches the stream from the beginning, they just they get the content right away. Whatever the headline says, that, that that's what I want at the beginning of the stream. Then we end up spending some time in the chat, just hanging out, going back and forth, talking about movies and I guess whatever comes up. So 8-bit video is fine if you don't need to push your grade much, but under stress, it will break for sure. It's the biggest problem I used to have with Sony. Yep, absolutely, Trevor. Uh, ow, one hour, very nice video. Your content is amazing. Keep going, man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'll just keep doing my thing. I, I just make the type of content I would enjoy, I suppose. And hopefully other people find it valuable. I know a lot of people don't. And they don't have to watch. I get it. It's not Peter McKinnon. It's not a, a banger every episode. Some cool, dope video. It's me sitting here talking. Which is is something but i don't think anyone would call this a banger anyway david says also i grew up skateboarding and love z boys uh mid 90s had a very nostalgic look not big fan of the movie but fun to watch for the looks for sure i love the look of the whiplash movie have you seen it yes i have seen whiplash whiplash uh i really enjoy that film i also like how it looks I'm trying to think if there's anything specific in there. I mean, there's just a lot of... It's a very dark, moody film. Uh, so, aside from that, you could always... If you like the look of something and you want to recreate it, just have it while you're shooting something, like as a, as a visual frame of reference. You'll find that it's usually pretty easy to achieve certain looks if you're just actually looking at it. It's most of the time when people struggle is when they're going into a shoot 
and they're trying to go from memory of like, oh yeah, I like how Whiplash looked. Like, let's make it look like that. You almost need the visual reference right there next to you. So when you look at your image, you go, oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. We should make it more like this. And then if you're just mirroring what they're doing in like a, a movie or a TV show you like, it's usually pretty easy to see it and replicate it if you have it side by side. It's when you're doing it out of context and you're going from memory that things get lost in translation. Toddy says, do you believe if there's any update coming to ProRes RAW that will allow to save more data from the camera like ISO information and white balance? Uh, I'm not aware. I don't follow the development of ProRes RAW. I know it is a feature. I just, I don't have a way to record it with, uh, I don't have a uh, Ninja 5 and I don't have a camera that does it. So the Blackmagic does RAW internally. And then the GH5, I don't think they ever updated the GH5 for ProRes RAW. Uh, that is a feature on the S1H, but you need the right recorder, which I also don't have. So there's some technical limitations there. I'm glad it's a thing and hopefully it will become more and more common because I do hear great things about it, but I personally haven't shot or edited anything with ProRes RAW. Uh, not even Jesus gets everybody happy. You're good, man. Oh, excellent. You're good. Don't worry. Just keep doing Oh, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Yes, even Jesus didn't get everyone happy. In fact, he got killed. For what, so hopefully that's not me. Hopefully I'm not a uh, Jesus situation where they're going to murder me for what I'm saying. But, uh, you know, the canon people don't really like what I have to say about the R5. I get it. It's it, People take things very personally, and they're not meant that way. If you like the R5 or you like to put film grain on your stuff, like this is, it's all, it's at the end of the day, Whatever tool gets the job done that you need done, it's kind of subjective in that way. However, we can argue over the specs of saying, hey, it would be nice if I could use this feature for longer, but instead it overheats, so therefore it's not a tool I want in my toolkit. I think that's totally valid, and I don't know why people uh, get so upset about it. I think it's a, you know, a personal attachment to the brand. It maybe is just the nature of the internet. There's a lot of factors there of why people uh, disagree. Also, me saying stuff, if someone sees a video, it might be the first time and they don't really understand my vibe or all the other videos I've made. Someone made a comment about either like the GH, it was the GH6. I taught, I made a video talking about the rumors from the GH6, uh, some predictions for the GH6, as well as like a wish list. I put that in the title, I talked about it, I've shot with the GH cameras from the GH1, the GH1, hacked it, because that's what you did with the GH1. And then the GH4 and the GH5, I skipped the two and the three because I didn't really need them at the time, but the four and the five. So talking about the six, it's like, I've been with the GH line for a long time, even enough to even look at the S1H when a lot of people don't even consider that camera. Um, they just don't even, it doesn't even come up. You'll see people talking about the R5 and the A7S and they're like, oh yeah, you know, uh, Sony can get away because it's 12 megapixels, but anything higher than that and the camera overheats. And it's like the S1H does it and that's like 24 megapixels. So I get that Canon's 45, but like it just doesn't even come up in these conversations of like, oh, if you if you want a, a video camera, just go, you have to go buy a cine camera. It's like, well, the S1H isn't a cinema camera, I guess, depending on how you classify it, but I would classify it as a hybrid. That does it without overheating. And then you say, oh, that has a fan in it. Well, yeah, well then, then they should have put a fan in the R5. That's what I'm saying. Like they should have done something to make it work the way they say it's gonna work without just saying, oh yeah, it overheats, sorry. And then people are like, well, then what good are the features? So I don't know, that's a, a funny, funny, funny way that people go about communicating and talking. But I do imagine that a lot of people, if they've never listened to my videos before, they don't have any sense of, they think like I'm a hater or a complainer or don't know what I'm talking about or uh, just shoot videos in my office at home. Like, that's all fair. Like, you don't, you don't have to know, um, but. Uh, Toddy making us all look bad. You don't have to give super chats. I really do appreciate it. That's fantastic. Um, but you're not obligated to. There's, you know, there's 20 of us here hanging out. Like, that's very, very easy to read the chat as long as it's not, you know, spamming away, which if it is at that point, then I, I'll just read the ones I can see. But we don't have to do the super chat thing for me to read. I'll go through them all and we'll just hang out and have a good time. Although I am probably going to wrap this up pretty soon because it's getting late. The overheat people, Canon people, I love my S1H. Yeah, the S1H, I rented it recently and had a great time filming with it. I wish I still had it. I just wish it were cheaper and then I probably would buy it. It'd be a lot easier to buy it. Because then I feel like investing, 
It's that risky thing. I hope, fingers crossed, Panasonic sticks with it and they come out with an S2 because I could get into the L-mount you know, and have the adapters and build out the kit the exact way I would want, but I just want to make sure that they're going to support it and I want to know that they're actually going to fix their autofocus issues because right now, Sony and Canon, they do it better. And that is important. At a certain at a certain point, I want something that can do helpful features like pinpoint autofocus in both video and photo. So it's uh, they got to kind of get get that autofocus working, Panasonic, and then and then I think people will be uh, pretty excited, especially if you keep innovating in the video side of things the way they have been. You'll never please the internet, toughest audience on earth, because it's literally the earth. Absolutely true. No, and my goal is not to please everybody. I think the the funny part of it is just the reaction people have, or like the jumping to conclusions, or they'll like they'll say stuff that's like, no, that's in the video. Like you just didn't watch it. So or like, you know, well you know that if you take the cards out, you can record to an external monitor with the R5. And I go, I'm I'm pretty sure I talked about that in the video. So like I'm I'm aware. So it's just funny the the way people jump to conclusions or they think something of you that's not actually true. And I don't take any of it personally. I've been on the internet long enough to know, like, it, there's no hurt feelings here. I laugh at most of the comments that are funny. If you've been around my channel long enough, maybe you'll even remember the days of uh, loads of fun leaving uh, troll comments, which was, like, the greatest. I think that's awesome. I think it's super funny uh, when people get so... They like they'll watch every video and comment on every video, but just to leave hate, like I, I think it's funny because like everyone, I've even made a video recently, kind of poking fun at Peter McKinnon. Oddly enough, right, that uh, comes up in the chat, but you know I made a poking fun at Peter McKinnon. Like, but it's nothing against him. I I like the guy. I watch his content. I think he does a great job. I think everybody does a great job. I'm trying to think of any one person I've seen on YouTube that I'm like, oh no, this person's terrible. Uh, almost everybody does a really good job because like as long as you do it from like your own personal perspective i think there's stuff like there's a video i watched uh it was a guy he was i forget the channel now um but it was like a smaller channel i think three thousand subscribers something like that so not anyone you know super prominent and he was talking about how like why he wants the r5 and why he thinks the r5 the canon r5 is a great camera and he's going to keep with his pre-order and he's really excited to get it it's like totally fair totally valid i'm not going to go in his comments and be like you're an idiot because like he's not if it works for him that's great and if other people it's the s1h which like that's probably what i gravitate towards or the a7s3 they're all they're all decent cameras for the job and everyone's job is slightly different which is the benefit of it we're not all doing the same thing so some people have to do weddings. It's very different than people who do extreme sports compared to the people who do headshots, compared to the people who just do short narrative films, compared to the people who do documentaries, compared to the people who do commercials or wedding videos or whatever. It runs It runs the entire spectrum. So there's, there's enough jobs to go around, hopefully, and enough gear to satisfy all of our needs. And But yet we're always going to want more. We're always going to want it to be better. If the R5 didn't overheat, it would be the best, like everyone would love the Canon R5 if it didn't overheat. There's nothing else about the camera that anyone cares about or nitpicks or gripes about. No one says, uh, oh, it doesn't have C-Log3. I mean, it's coming in a firmware update, but like no one's even talking about it. The only issue is that the camera did not function in a way that was like usable. That's it. Other than that, like I would have bought one, but I'm not going to if it's if I can't rely on it. Uh, GH Alexa LUT, uh, what's your thoughts on that? I've been using the LUT, it looks pretty good. Yeah, so um, that's where I started with the uh, GH Alexa LUT. So that's from uh, Emotive Color. You can get it for the GH5, but also is available for the Ursa uh, G2 as well as the Pocket 6K and the Pocket 4K, and then the X-T4 and the X-T3, and the GH5S for that matter, all of them. So the fact that uh, that's there, the other LUTs that I mentioned are the Leeming LUTs. There's many, many LUTs out there, but I kind of like the functionality of these. Emotive being more for like replicating Alexa, and then the Leeming LUTs being more for like matching cameras and making everything standardized. I think both have value in certain situations. So I will say the Leeming LUTs are a little cheaper, but not, not significantly. Um, so you can kind of see the, the pricing on here. And there's a lot more of these too. 
for a variety of cameras. So I'd say, oh, even the LS300 is on here. That's awesome. The one thing they don't have for leaming is the Ursa Mini Pro isn't called out here. So there's the Blackmagic Pocket 4K and then the, the Pocket like micro cameras. I assume you can probably use the Pocket 4K uh, or 6K with the Ursa Mini, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, I have to do some testing. So I did buy those just to test it out, but I, there's no Ursa Mini on here. Um, which it seems like they're targeting more of like the lower end uh, hybrid, you know, GoPros and drone type things. So it doesn't surprise me that's not on here. It would be nice if it were, but that's just for my personal benefit. But there's the S1H on here, uh, the GH series, the A series, Fujifilm, like everything. And then the emotive color is a little bit more uh, limited in terms of options, but all very popular cameras. I'm surprised they don't have uh, a Sony one on here. Maybe they'll do like an A7S III because now that that will be 10 bit, maybe a little bit more practical to grade. But uh, the stuff looks really, really nice. Um, the problem with LUTs, and I talked about this before, but I think it's worth reiterating, LUTs are the technically right way to do it, which is what Gerald's video is all focused on of like, you can't just add contrast and, and saturation. And that is true. You definitely have to play around with your curves to get a more accurate interpretation of log to linear. So the LUT is the right way to do it, but the problem becomes the LUT is very specific of what the input needs to be to make the right output. I said it all before, but that's like that's my struggle with LUTs is a lot of times it's not ideal shooting conditions. Someone didn't get their exposure, you know, the 18% gray card to the right IRE on set, so you know, you're you're kind of already off and then you have to, you know, apply a kind of like a pre-LUT to get the exposure right to begin with. So then when you do apply the LUT, then it transforms the the image and the color and the exposure in the right way. And then after that, you're applying this kind of black point for at least the GH Alexa LUTs, the emotive LUTs. So like there's like multiple LUTs involved and you're not, at that point, you're not even talking about stylizing yet. That's still the color grade on top of it. So that's what I can't tend to opt for, at least with the Ursa Mini Pro anyway. The film mode is so flexible, I think, that the normal grading tools that I'm familiar with work really, really well in a lot of situations. Most of the time, it's it's never a problem, although on occasion it can be. You do a certain things a certain way, and, and you're safe, and you can get away with a lot. There's some other things that I don't recommend you touch. That's what I did the whole, like, how I do the color. And again, it's not like I'm doing it the right way. I, the LUT is the technically right way to do it. So that's why I want to talk about that first. But sometimes it's not always practical. So that's why having the tools and resources like, hey, if you're shooting stuff like this, understand how these sliders work in Premiere with Lumetri because they're actually very powerful if you know how to use them to your advantage. And then you can compensate a little bit more for maybe you don't have a LUT, maybe you don't want to buy them because they're a little bit expensive. Like, I don't know what your budgets are, but you know, they're not terribly expensive, but they're, they're also not like $5. They're like 50 or, you know, 80, depending on, uh, the, the package you're getting. So it all depends. So having a, a, an adequate understanding of all of the components allows you to make the right choice rather than someone just saying, Oh, you have to do it this way. Cause I guarantee you, if you think that you have to use LUTs, because like that's the right way to do it, you're gonna get footage and you're gonna put a LUT on there and it's gonna look awful because it wasn't shot properly, because you don't have the right LUT for whatever whatever they were they were doing, the right camera, whatever. And so you're constantly fighting with these like individual details and nuances of like someone being like, well, the LUT's the right way to do it, so you have to do it that way and feeling, oh my gosh, I have to use a LUT, I have to use a LUT. And meanwhile, that could be what's hurting the project and hurting the footage and the look of it. So knowing both systems and both ways to do it is is beneficial as well as knowing you know the differences between premiere and resolve and final cut like the more you know about all of these things the better you are at making the right decision in the moment or per project so you can do it faster more efficient and have better results afterwards rather than just listening to someone say this is the right way and then thinking oh i guess i got to put a lut on it and then everything's broken um because it's not always the right way, if that makes sense. It is always the right way, but it's also not always the right way. Let's see, I'll wrap this up here. 
Gonna have to rewatch and see those LUTs. Start at the beginning. Yeah, it's like, it, like once the stream is over, right at the beginning, I start pretty much right away. Zcam has some incredible base LUTs for the cameras. Good to know. Um, BMD film is amazingly flexible, even just in ProRes. Yeah, I mean, and granted, Blackmagic makes DaVinci Resolve, so it would make sense that their camera would shoot with like a really great profile, their film profile. And I don't actually know if it is log. Like, I don't know. Um, Cause if you look it up, people say, oh yeah, it's their log mode, but I don't know if it's technically log or if it's just like log. I don't know, but it grades really, really well, even without a LUT, but you can use a LUT if you, if you need to, or, or would like to, it's all about preference and what works best for your workflow. So no judgment here. Just wanted to share kind of how I like to do it. So maybe there's some lessons in there you can learn and say, oh, okay, cool. Like I, I'll try that and maybe it'll work for you. Maybe it won't. Let's get me 50% of the way. I use them to correct my footage and then I can stylize for sure. That's definitely a workflow. I like keeping it as simple as possible. And that's why I like the black magic and doing some things that like kind of always, always work with the footage for whatever reason, the highlights and shadows in Lumetri just work really well for adding contrast to Ursa mini footage um, and then taking it from there. It's always the baseline, but I'll wrap it up there. Thank you everyone for hanging out. I appreciate it. Hopefully you learned something along the way and I'll talk to you next time. See you guys.